What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Bloke in a Bar. But it's not just any episode, it's a brand new little segment or show. We'd like to call it the Nosebleeds because we've got essentially fans from each club have come into the studio. They're on the beer, so it might get a bit rowdy. I've been doing a lot of boxing training lately, boys, so, and girls, so just know I'm ready to defend myself at all times. No, all jokes aside, uh, got the crew in here, which is fantastic. And basically what the show is, is just getting a feel for what are the fans of the clubs think? What are their opinions on players and movement and CBA deals? All that good stuff. But as usual, I've always got the great Gurino here with me. Gurino, how you feeling, mate? Yeah, I'm on, mate. Uh, Tim was a bit upset this, this afternoon. So he's not going to be the best looking on the panel anymore. So Oh, really? really? Looking around the room. Yeah, that's fair. Oh. To be fair, it wasn't a high bar, boys. It wasn't a high bar. <laughs> <laughs> Timmy, how are you, bro? I'm good, mate. I uh, was actually just in the loo at the studio just before, and we've obviously got one of, or just about every club here, a fan from every club, and walked out and essentially there's a long hallway you can go right you can go left yep. left is towards the studio and there's just this bloke coming from the far right of it he'd already been in the studio i went to the wrong spot and i went what a moron and it's the canberra Raiders fan i'm just like oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh no i oh, know um and we we did we have to we didn't want to leak this information and but unfortunately we just got to tell the truth there's one team that isn't here it's the penrith panthers no, I mean, is, does that mean they're cocky? They're arrogant? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. No, unfortunately, the Penrith Panthers uh, fan couldn't make it. He's got some work to get to, which is fair enough. Um, but let's get straight into it. Oh, actually, first, before we get into it, huge live tour, country tour. We are going um, basically up, up the east coast of Australia. First, we're going to the Grand Hotel in Armidale, Friday, 3rd of March, 6 p.m. Tickets, there is no, it's entry is free. You don't have to buy a ticket. Then we're going Friday 10th of March, 6 p.m. Riverina in Wagga Wagga. Friday 17th of March, 6 p.m. Great Western Hotel, Rockhampton. Friday 24th of March, 6 p.m. Uh, Gilligan's in Cairns. Uh, make sure to get down, guys, because these, these country tours won't come around very often, and we would love to see everyone from the surrounding area. Now let's get straight into it, shall we? The biggest talking point of the off-season, in my opinion, outside of a couple of rugby players, players wrestling each other, outside of a uh, Broncos player saying the coach isn't a good coach, uh, the CBA deal. And I would love to, I mean, what's your feeling, boys, now that we're getting closer to the season and it's still not sorted? Are you worried or are you, how are you feeling about it? And I remember sitting here three months ago saying, surely it's around the corner. Mm. Now the kickoff of the season's just around the corner. It is all getting a little bit scary. And as you said, it's been a pretty quiet off-season. So imagine if we didn't have the CBA deal. Nothing what would we have about. spoken about? Exactly, exactly. Uh, they actually cancelled the NRL launch yesterday to, to avoid the, I guess, the impact of the players boycotting, which is a bit of a chess move from the NRL. Thank God we got the pre-season challenge in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a ripper, wasn't it? That was great. <laughs> I need to be seated about that one. When they, when they were the commentators with the Sharkies and... Uh, who, oh, shoot the play, Sharkies play um, right? Not Doggies right. Doggies yeah. the, the commentators are constantly like Oh they need f Nine more offloads And I was like Man I don't give a no, shit No one <laughs> yeah. No one cares who won it People definitely didn't give a shit About who came last <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no one cares who came last Just like Let's get to the real stuff hey? 100% But yeah I open up to the floor CBA deal If anyone wants to To be the first to to talk about there, do they have any anyone with strong feelings in the CBA, whether it be anti-player, anti-NRL, anyone with some feelings? No one wants to open up? No strong feelings? <laughs> it's gonna be some strong feelings. It's it's a hard one from a fan to sit and look at it um, from both perspectives, I guess. Mm. It, you see the players coming out and talking about, you know, not asking for, for more money. Mm. There are things in this, what they're requesting that I completely agree for. More medical attention, more support after football, which I, I think is desperately needed in the game. It's the revenue share type of stuff, which as a fan, you sort of look back and go, as a whole, you're paid fairly well. And I feel like that's one of the things that's holding it back more than anything. Um, so, yeah, like, I think that's the biggest sticking point for me is like, I completely agree there needs to be more support for players. Mm. Pre, well, through injuries, post career, um, but it can't be any more about money for me. Yeah, um, and I, everyone needs to be paid fairly. I completely appreciate that. The revenue they bring to the game, all, all well and good, um, but we just want to see everyone on the park playing footy. Um, yeah, so yeah, no, it's, it's a really good point. Like I, I agree with you in regards to. I mean, you don't want players blowing up about oh, we want an extra, you know, 
10 million dollars or whatever the amount is especially when you know like you're working your full-time job going mate i would kill to be able to have the opportunity i would pay to play nrl like the opportunity so i totally get that i do think that right now so i think initially it was about the money that's in the players wanted more like as in they wanted so basically what happened was is the nrl came out and offered less percent of the revenue than they were already on so i think they're on about like 33 percent they came the nrl reportedly all on the grapevine kind of stuff come out and gave them lower percentage than that now it is more about like the, the finer details of what we're talking about like medical stuff but i am i'm probably if the money is sorted and we've got the women's game even though it's not everything that the women were asking for it does look like they're getting at least a salary cap and at least some some surety of some direction um I, I, if the NRL players are being sticklers over like minor details, that's when I would be like, "Come on, boys! Like, let's just get this going." Missing a, a round one over some a smaller details. Um, I don't know if you wanted to talk as a, a female fan. What, what are your thoughts on the, the CBA and the women's game? Um, I would say for the women, it's been quite hard to watch. Mm. I think we've got a really good potential for that um, game to really kick off. Mm. So. I would probably say at this point to say I think we need – is it by the end of May they need to have players locked in? Yeah. And we're almost at March and we can't do anything about locking in some of those really key um, players from a lot of clubs. That mm. that hurts. Yeah. And from the men's perspective, I do feel for – I think it's hard listening to it when it comes from the guys that are earning the big bucks. Yeah, but sure. there's a huge amount of players that – are still earning quite little so mm. that's i feel for them that mm. that's hard yeah yeah for sure it's uh it's interesting because like i was a player that was always on like not much money so my first contract was like eight thousand bucks second contract twenty five thousand uh third contract was fifty thousand um fourth contract fifty thousand i think the the third one was fifty thousand with match payments so if i played i got two grand a game um so basically i was an nrl player on that this is when i was playing nrl regularly 50 grand plus match payments which sounds like a lot of money like you end up earning about 100 grand but like obviously that's not long term it's not anything uh then i was on 90 grand no match payments and then i came back on 50 grand no match payments and then 50 grand no match payments again so exactly right like it's the guys like myself that we didn't really get paid that much in footy like when i quit i didn't have savings i didn't have anything um with the women's game i think it's like one of those things where like a it's We've got the revenue to do it, so we should do it. But also, like, it's kind of, like, inevitable. Like, when – it's got to happen. It's not like it's – like, when are we going to make the step? We may as well make the step now because if we wait another five years, we'll get left behind. Because The AFL are investing so much money in the women's game, whereas the NRL, w women's game actually gets viewed more than the AFL, and yet they get paid way less, have less contracts. AFL has, like, full contracts, like – as in full top 30s and that minimum wages um a lot of the afl girls getting paid more than i got paid which is great for the girls like i'm not the kind of person that's like oh well i didn't get paid that much so they shouldn't get paid that like two wrongs don't make a right um anyone else with any thoughts on the rlpa i think it's important that the players tackle it now as well because if they just like leave it as it is and they wait for another year it it, it empowers the nrl more and it makes them like have more of a say into it. And I think if the players tackle it now and get all the issues out, it puts the, the power back under the player. And it is hard hearing the players on the big contracts complain about it as well, but they are the ones with the loudest voice. So I think it's important that they get around it as well. Mm. I don't necessarily think that they are um, thinking that they, they need more money or whatever. I think they're just looking out for their mates and I think it's important that they get a say as well. Yeah, for sure. And that's, that's a, it's the double-edged sword where if, let's say, like, for example, Harry Grant's a perfect example. He came out and he said, basically, like, we may as well be tradies or something like that. But when you read the full quote, it's like he's saying the younger guys may as well be tradies. The problem is, is like, you know, you know the media has a, an incentive to get as many clicks as possible and create the outrage. Um, and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I agree with you guys. Like, I think that the, the aim should be for the lower tier players. It should be for the starting of the women's game. Um, what, you got any thoughts on it, mate? Yeah, just in regards to the women's game, I just, like, I'm a primary school teacher and I just see all the kids at school, especially young women who, uh, try, or young girls who are trying to get into sport at the moment and there's such a big market for it. Mm. And 
Oh, I just think it is madness, just even from like a financial standpoint, that like the NRL isn't even thinking about making a big push for it because like it might not be paying now, but I just see the market now that like in 10, 15 years could be paying massive because yeah. like it is such a big market that kids, especially girls, may go towards dancing or netball mm. when it could be rugby league. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're totally right in regards to like, it's actually a, a positive financially if we get women involved in the game. Because let's, let's say, you know, young women, young women or girls, let's say they play it for a few years, but then they, they stop playing it. Like, does, how many people here play rugby league, actually play it on the weekend? Do you know what I mean? But how many is obviously watch it? And so it would be same with a lot of women. Like they get that engagement with the game. They play it for a few years. They may not continue to play the game, but they're going to watch the game. What does that mean? That means more money for everyone. That means more involvement. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree, mate. I think that a lot of people try to fall back on the, oh, but they don't make enough money now and they don't profit and all that kind of stuff. But you, like that's, I think that's short-sighted thinking because – not only do we have the right the money to do it not only have players been putting things in place to make sure the women get part of the men's revenue but in 10 15 years if we don't get the the women involved they will get involved in a sport somewhere like they will get involved and if it's afl that that could be a massive blow to rugby league um and plus it, i just think it's a, the right thing to do anyone else any thoughts on the the cba yeah, I think it's oh, it's it's tough watching it from afar. Um, mm. Never played league runner. I was always a union boy, but always always watched league. That was always the sport I preferred to watch. Always never missed a doggies game, all those sorts of things. So um, as a dad of a new girl as well and the girls' side of things, I'm excited for the girls' competition in 15, 18 years when she's, you know, yep. 18 years and potentially playing it sort of thing then. Um, so exciting now, but obviously, again, feel for the girls now that, have to go through that um, and are still fighting to um, have a better wage as we go along. So I think it, the hardest point is that none of us really know exactly what is in the agreement yet. Yeah. We don't know what's coming out. So a lot of it is hearsay, a lot of it's yep. uh, grapevine sort of stuff. And I think, again, what you touched on, Denon, was that we're only hearing it from the media is focusing either on what the NRL has said or what the top tier players are saying. We're not hearing from the 80% of players that are on you know, under 200, 300 grand. Mm. I think Timmy said a few weeks ago, like the average career spans only 40 to 60 games. Like you're not making much money at the end of the day. They've mm. committed 10 plus years into the sport and yeah. they're, not, they're, they're starting again or starting their lives again at 25, 30 years old and starting from scratch when a lot of us have had a chance to go to uni, build a career, mm. work our way through. So I think it's really important that we do look to elevate that and put some more money into the game and respect that. And at the end of the day, it just almost looked greedy on the NRL part at least that they're not willing to invest into that future so yeah for sure it's actually funny because like so my brother while i was playing nrl and like you know the family's talking about oh yeah good denon's you know playing for the broncos or whatever my brother was on peanuts at university doing his medical degree and so all those years where i was you know supposedly killing it he was grinding away getting his medical degree now he's absolutely killing it and I, you know what i mean he's going much better at career wise than me he, he'll get a job wherever he wants however long he wants for the next 50 years kind of thing so um yeah any any thoughts oh, and just quickly as well sorry with the um the hard thing with the media as well is like the game so nine and fox obviously pay massive money for the rights so they're like they have an interest in the nrl so it's a very hard if you're getting information from there not to say that they're all wrong or incorrect but there is an interest between the NRL and the, the nine kind of uh, yeah. relationship. I think like it's it's come up a few and times. Box. You only hear from those big time players, Harry Grant, for example. Like, you've got to feel for Harry Grant that he comes out and does the right thing <laughs> and he gets smashed. bashed from pillar to post. And the reality is that if a guy that had played five first grade games came out, do you think a journalist is going to write an article on it? Mm. Not a hope in hell. No one cares at the end of the day. And if I'm another NRL player at Harry Grant's level, I'm going, fuck look what Harry had to deal with. Yeah. No thanks. Yeah, no. Nah, it's no brutal. Way. Um, you going to say something? I was going to say, I think it's easy, like, um, from a fan's perspective to say, get it done. And I think that as a fan's like, collective, that is the feeling. Like, we mm. just want to watch footy. It's supposed to start in two weeks. Um, but I think we're not in the closure room talks. We don't know what the sticking point is. Mm. But if it's things like the surgery, um, you know, getting your surgeries in your one year, then 
hats off to the players for standing up and and fighting for that. Like people, whether it be you know Nathan Cleary, he may not be fighting for himself, mm. but you look at blokes like James Roby, um, just to take someone from the Super League, um, who's a warrior who's played 522 games. When he decides to hang him up, you're going to tell me he's going to get all his surgeries done in 12 months and then go out and be a brickie or something? Like, oh, mate. You know, he's played footy since he was 15 or whatever. He'd be in, like, bed like that, like a zombie. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, in 12 years. months. Like, yeah. it's not it's not even possible. Yeah. A lot of surgeries have a three-month wait <laughs> yeah. or, you know, recovery period. And So my point is, if that is a sticking point, as a fan, I'm happy to, to take my fan's hat off and say, I miss footy for two weeks. Mm. It was good on you blokes. Yeah. Um, helping blokes out in, in the future. Yeah, for sure. Is, does anyone, is anyone a tradie here? Tradie? So you would have worked, you would have done deals like uh, CBA deals and that with your employer? No. Not really? Uh, not with my employer, like, not really. So you don't have like a strong union or anything like that? Or like if I work, I have worked on like a commercial site where yeah. we have like a, ABA agreement, yeah, like CBA basically. Yeah, yeah, and it's so, basically it's similar to the same, same thing. Same thing, yeah, yeah, basically. So, which means like everyone on that job site is paid fairly, pretty yeah. much. So, and they they like the same. It's funny because like the same things come up. Like the workers, they want to be taken care of in certain scenarios if they get injured, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, good chat um, in regards to the CBA deal. I, I just, I hope it gets done because five years is a long time, man. Mm. Like five years, if you don't nail it now, you've got to live with that for five mm. years. Like for example, <coughs> let's say we, let's say the players allowed the women's game to just cop the, just, oi girls, just turn up and, and whoever turns up gets a jersey and we'll pay you. For five years, we'd have to do that. Yeah. But meanwhile, the <coughs> AFL has, what, 16 clubs? All top yeah. 30s? We'd get decimated the one that intrigues me Kempi, is that the point around the post career and the surgeries that you just spoke at within 12 months mm. and and i don't know what percentage of like stalling the negotiations are this is but i don't know the answer to it because you look at all these ex-players coming out now and saying you know they got surgeries well after their career and mm. they need to be looked after that's what the current crop of players they're looking after their future mm. and you know on face value that's fine i get that and i agree with it mm. You can just see the NRL are looking at that going, well, what if you don't play an NRL game from when you're 25 onwards and you play a handful and then you go and play bush footy for the next 10 years, bust yourself up and then start claiming these, you know, your surgeries, your hospital bills, all this sort of stuff. It's such a grey area. Yeah. And that, like, I'm not in a position to, to come up with a, an answer to that. But like, what, he, what is an answer to that? I don't know because you can see how both sides want different answers yeah, to that one for sure i think that it actually plays into the exiting <coughs> of players like i think that we have to get better at the process of players leaving so part of it could be when you leave you don't just like go on mad monday and you know go crazy like you can do that if you want but you have to within two weeks of like your retirement you get full body scans the full check mm. you get a doctor to say this is what is needed and then anything that comes up you know like i'm, I'm of the mind and this is from an ex-player if something comes up 10 years later, and even if it is footy related, like you can't expect the NRL to know that your body, because your hip was unbalanced, because you did your hip there, your shoulder, you know, in 10 years time became sore. Like that's, I think that's a bit unfair on the NRL if I'm being honest. So I reckon if we could like increase it to maybe two to three years, maybe three years, everyone gets fully scanned before they go. They, they sit down with a doctor. The doctor says, this is what you need. And then the player signs off on it. The doctor signs off on it and they go, boom. Now we completely know completely independent doctor, you know, not, yeah. not biased to either side. And they mm. just say, yep, this injury is, is a result of the injury sustained. Sorry, mm. this surgery is needed as a result of the injury sustained yep. playing X game where they, this player was hurt. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that could work. Any, any final thoughts on the CBA deal guys? I was just going to ask Kempi if it's all right, even though I'm an employee, not an <laughs> audience member, but like you see teachers striking and nurses strike in the city all the time. And mm. sort of the media quite often have like the positive spin on it like from the outside looking in as a former player, like what's your opinion on that when it comes to like sort of footy play striking, I guess one of better words. And there's always like seems to be a negative spin on it as opposed to a positive spin. Like does that frustrate you? And do you think that frustrates the boys heaps or? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Cause like it's, we're so as people, we just look at the now, like, so we go, all right, this player is on 600 grand. Shut up, bro. Cause I wish I had, you know, I wish I was getting paid 10 grand a week or whatever. But when you actually look at it, you go, okay, this player has been 
most players have been playing footy since they were six years old. So he's basically been training to be what he's supposed to be for like, or he or she has, let's say, I don't know, 16 years, or let's just say 16 years. Now imagine a doctor from like the age of six was studying four times a week. So like Tuesday for three hours, or two, we'll just say two, two hours, Thursday, two hours, and then on Saturday on two hours. So those, all three of those days he was studying to, or she was studying to be a doctor. I don't think anyone would sit there and go, you're not entitled to be paid a lot of money, especially when let's, let's imagine a world where the doctor could only be a doctor for 10 years maximum. We would never sit there and be like, oh, he's only, or he or she is only allowed to earn X amount of dollars and they should never complain about any, anything. So I think a lot of people, when you take a step back and you go, well, that's 600 grand, spread it over a 40 year career, because that's what it is, it's a career. It actually turns out to be, you know, 150K or whatever. So yeah, it, it's frustrating, but at the same time, I get it, man. Like everyone is, a lot of people doing it tough. Like a lot of people have got bills to pay. They don't want to hear about the person on 600 grand whinging about anything. Even if you try to logically explain to them, like it's not really 600K because they've got to retire or quit or whatever. So I understand why people, you know, I get it. I, I when I quit footy, I was working a job that paid forty, fifty k or whatever, and it's stressful, man. Like it's you don't you're not thinking about the six hundred k guy and how hard he or she's life is. You're going, mate. I would kill to have half of that. Um, so although it sucks, I kind of get it. I kind of get it. Um, anything else on CBA? No, no. Okay, now. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry, sorry. I was going to no, jump no, no, in just going. about the women's game again quickly. Mm. Um, I guess also it's hard seeing like the NRL not putting money into it when you see clubs, they're putting so much money and time, resources into elite pathways now as well mm. to create opportunities for young girls and things yep. like that. So it's hard when the NRL is not really matching that. There's also like confusion amongst fans, I think, when there's the Harvey Norman women's game as well and mm. you have a player playing for the Bulldogs there and then para at the elite level. So yeah. it's like where where do they sort of sit i think yeah. fans do get confused by that so until we have that better structure it's yeah going to be hard for the game to progress that's a really good point because even me who like i every day read about rugby league like like i'll see a player like um tiana uh penitani is yep. it Penitani? like i'll see her and like one year she's with the sharks but then she was playing you know, with the eels and I'm like, it's really hard to track it. And again, I don't know whether she transferred and that's why, um, but you're right. Like we need to create more structure so that, cause like, I think a lot of young people, like there is still loyalty to clubs for sure. There's no denying that. But I do think a lot of young people are actually, it's kind of like the LeBron phase where people will support a player and go, well, that player plays for this club now. So I'm going to support this club. Uh, yeah, the women's game for me is surprising. Like, the, what I think with the NRL, I, I, I wish they would be a little bit more open. And they don't have to because I'm pretty sure that they're a private company. But I wish they would show us, like, where... And they do release a financial statement, but it's long and it's hard to kind of get a gauge of where the money's going. But, like, I think it'd be really good if, if the fans could see, like, where is the money going? So then, like, we can be... Like, if let's say there was $50 million in straight-up profit last year. Let's see okay, we've got 50 million in profit, then we definitely know we could at least give 10, 15 million dollars to the women's, you know what I mean? Like then we could really see where, whereas if, if they released the statements and showed we made only 10 million or whatever profit, I think a lot of people would be like, okay, we need to cut back on a few things. Like well, clearly we can't, I, I do wish there was a bit more transparency. I understand why there isn't because then you open yourself up to everyone having an opinion. Um, but you're right in regards to the, the elite pathways. I think that needs to be more structured where, so you can really follow a, a young player all the way through the ranks kind of thing. Um, yeah, good stuff. CBA deal. Get it done boys, please. I want to watch footy on round one. Um, now let's get to uh, some predictions. What team outside the eight will make finals this year? Guru, I'll start with you, mate. Cheers, mate. Um, just quietly, is that Reese Robson sitting there too? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> dead ringer. Dead ringer. Unreal. Um, I, I'm leaning towards Canterbury at the moment, mate. I think that obviously they got dusted on the weekend, but I think that you can see a shell of a really good footy side building there. I, if I'm being honest, I'm sort of of the opinion, I'm not sure if the eight will change. Based on last year, I think it'll be very similar to what it is. But if I had to pick one side that'll come in, I've got a feeling that it might be Canterbury. Can I pick one side that's going to fall out? Can, can we both it. pick one side Don't that's going to fall out? Canberra, there's a gone. <laughs> They're gone. 
<laughs> Mate, they are gone. Kick him out of the comp. Oh. <laughs> I had a grade three Hartledge on Sunday afternoon watching that game. <laughs> I sat out the Monday bloke potty. I said, I can't deal with Kempi's shit. <laughs> And then this popped up Wednesday night and said, oh, Kempi's just going to be stewing and stewing, waiting for this one. And yeah, here we are. So talk to me, uh, talk to me in six months, please. <laughs> Who do you think will make it out of the eight? It, okay, who's the most likely? So not necessarily that they will, but most likely outside the eight. I I cannot look past the, the Manly Seagulls. I mean, and it's obviously so Tom Trebojevic pendant, but let's say they've worked miracles on Tommy Turbo's hammy and he stays mm. fit this entire season. Not only can they make the eight, but they can win the competition. Mm. I think it's as simple as that. We've seen it a couple of years ago. We saw them... I mean, Tommy played the first six to eight rounds last season and it mainly weren't great, but it was early stages. They had a tough draw. Tommy fit firing at his best can take that team to a premiership. Now, I know there's a lot of cogs in that that need, need to work for them to, to go all the way, but you know, there's other sides that you say... Like the doggies, they could scrape into the eight. There's a few sides there. But Manly can genuinely win the comp if everything goes right for them, mm. a.k.a. Tommy stays fit. Well, all right, guys. Any uh, predictions on uh, who you think's going to... Most likely. So, I mean, you can say they're definitely going to make the eight, and we already know what this bloke's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd have to say the Broncos. I think I would have been a bit less confident prior to trials, and mm. I probably would have said para. Mm. But seeing how they played in the trials, I think Parra can't drop out. I think Broncos possibly come in. Sorry, Timmy, for I think for Canberra. Okay, I like that. I think the Broncos could fold this year if they don't sort <laughs> that toxic <laughs> environment. Mate. You know, we'll be back to 16 clubs. There'll be no buys. Supercoach will be easy. Uh, oh. oh, give me a break. Broncos could buy the Canberra club four <laughs> times over. <laughs> you could buy it and you still can't beat them on the ladder, mate. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you want to okay, give him the mic? <laughs> Broncos are going to pop off too early, like last year. Okay. Canberra Raiders are going to time their run. We're just getting the, the bad games out of the way now. And yep. then it doesn't count, it's trials. Yeah. Toxic yeah. culture, mate. <laughs> <laughs> mate, every time someone goes down to Canberra, they get done by the police. <laughs> Jackie Whiten out there wrestling Paul Luttrell. Luttrell's not about that. He wouldn't do oh. anything like that. That's right. It hasn't stopped Jackie in the past, has it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like uh, I, I would probably say Broncos in the eight, but watching Manly over the weekends, like the last couple of weekends, they do look quite good. Like I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say it because, you know, trials mean nothing. Like we all know mm. trials mean like a couple of years ago, Tigers towed up, um, was it Sharks or something? Manly. Manly. They towed Manly up and that was the year Manly went to prelim or? Yeah, Manly made the prelim that year. And so trials can be quite deceiving, but there is something about that Manly side that, like, even Cooper Johns is playing, like, really good footy, which is su not surprising because I think he's a talented footier player. But, like, how often do we see Storm fringes go to another club and play better? Mm. Which is, like, Storm is the best system mm. arguably out there. And so, like, although I would have, as I said, uh, I think on Monday, I would have liked Seabold to maybe get some success in, like, New South Wales Cup or, or Queensland Cup or whatever... I don't think, like, I know it was a disaster up in Brisbane. Trust me. I know. It was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. Um, and I know that I was, you know, quite critical of, of some of the decisions that Seabold made. But I don't think the jury's out on whether he can coach or not. Like, we do have to remember that, you know, yeah, okay, the Broncos went from a powerhouse, you know, to the wooden spoon. But it's a weird club. Like, it's got so, like, it's a one club. I mean, not anymore, but one team town. But the, the, the media around the Broncos is just a different beast. And people, I think, don't appreciate that. That's a, it's, what's crazy is it's still Wayne Bennett's club. So it, it's, it's a very weird scenario. Like, look, look what happened to Ivan Henjak when he was there. Like, whether you look, thought he was a good coach or he wasn't. When he got the sack, the media around it was insane. Like, insane. Um, Anthony Griffin got shown the door when they were going okay. Um, for, for Wayne to come back. So I do think Seabold deserves a second chance. And I, I do think he does have some good ideas. I just, with Manly, I hope he leans a little bit more into like the tradition and culture of the club. I think with Brisbane, he tried to be a bit too much like we are the new age and, you know, you know, constantly thinking about the, the future instead of kind of trying to connect the boys to the the yes the, the blokes of yesteryear. Um, anyone else with a top eight prediction? I was prediction? just saying about Manly. Mm. Um, obviously, I'm... Pretty keen that they're going to get back in the eight and win the comp, like Tim <laughs> said. Uh, it's it is hard to watch Manly play, hard to watch Tom Trebojevic play 
every time he's running the ball, you feel constantly sick because you know if he goes <laughs> down, that is your season Would gone. Would you move him to centre? No. You could keep him at fullback? Yeah. He's just he's watched him play the other year at fullback. He's just, he's just a freak. Uh, I think the biggest questions around Manly are going to be I think Dylan Walker's a big loss. Mm. I think Seabold coming in and, and what happened at the end of last year is how they're going to rally from that last year. Mm. That's the biggest concern I've got. Obviously, keeping Tom on the field is paramount, but how they're going to rally after um, what happened last year. Mm. And then Dylan Walker, I think he was so so good through the middle of the field. Creates, created so many opportunities for DCE to play on the back of his you know, quick play the balls and... Um, and breaking play open through the middle, I thought that was key. So, how they can you know overcome overcome that, and then how Seabold's going to get the, the team back together, I think, is the real key thing for Manly. On top of obviously Tommy, hundred percent. Just well, just on Manly and Seabs, I think really good thing that they've got what Jim Dimmick and uh, Shane Flanagan there mm. as well. So just like a different support structure to what he had when he was at um, at the Broncos. So mm. just think that's something that really can help him, sort of, especially like you know allow him to maybe take that more CEO approach to coaching rather than, you know, getting into, into the nitty gritty every day, yep. which I think is what he was doing when he was at the Broncos. That's a really good point. Cause like who, who were his assistants at Broncos? Like, and, and not to be disrespectful to the, the assistants, but I don't think they were that experienced. He got rid of all the old boys, right? And that yeah. was sort of, it seems like he's trying to not do that again. Yeah. Well, yeah, at least okay. he's bringing in people who have been successful elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and it's almost like a, a bit of pressure. Like if you start pl- coaching poorly, like you know Shane Flanagan is just nipping at your heels to take that yeah. job. Shane Flanagan and the one I just keep hearing good things about, Jimmy Dimmick. Mm. He sounds like a goer. Obviously yeah. got a, 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 like a, he was an interim coach at the Doggies. Wasn't he not, not upset that he didn't get the Bulldogs role, but like he was hoping to get it? Was that? Yeah, came in as interim yeah. and then got brushed for it. But mm. all I've heard is good things about Jim, Jim Dimmick. So when we sort of sat here back end of last season speculating about right, who's on the market to come in and take jobs if they become available. And I think Jim Dimmick's probably one that we overlooked a little bit. And mm. yeah, maybe he's next in line. You, yeah. you won't find a player that doesn't love Jimmy. Mm. They oh, really? all love him. They love yeah, him. He's a real player's coach. Um, Actually, really interesting that uh, news that just dropped from today from the great Andrew Webster. Uh, J- uh, Riles apparently mm. is being seriously considered for the Dragons. Now, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the current situation of the Dragons, Anthony Griffin, the boys. I mean, arguments. They had an argument, bro. The club in turmoil. Two footy players had an argument. What happens in Mudgee stays in Mudgee. I thought that was a saying. I thought that's what went around. Um, <laughs> I, it's a hard one because if you hook such an experienced coach and if you get rid of him, there's like Desi on the market, there's Jason, like there's some people being thrown around, but there's not really any top tier coaches on the market to look for. I think before I was talking to Timmy about maybe bringing Dean Young back to Dragons. I think he's at Cowboys, we said. But there's, it's hard because Hook's got experience. Like you said, he got sacked from Broncos and I think they came third or fourth that year. Like he's, he, he is a good coach. He, he did contribute pretty greatly to that Broncos team. I think they went to the grand final a year after he was mm-hmm. sacked. He's, he obviously has experience. He, he knows what he's doing. Um, as a Dragons fan, sometimes it's hard to understand what he's doing. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I'd like to have some faith in him. Um, but yeah, I, I just don't know who we bring in if we if we sack him. What do you, what do you reckon your squad's biggest issue is right now? You guys talked about it on the podcast. It it feels like they're not they don't want to play. It feels like they don't want to be there. It, it feels like there's a there's a culture problem there. You see, like with the dogs and even with the tigers now, they were in a much worse situation than we were last year and the the years before that. But you see them now. They they they. They look like they're enjoying their footy. They look like they're throwing the ball around. They're out there having, having a blast. Like, they really, really like playing. And then the Dragons look so flat, so out of energy. I just feel like there's a culture problem. And then it's hard to recruit off that as well. Mm. Like, the fans will blame the coach and the, the, the club for not recruiting well. But I feel like even if you offer a, a contract to a player mm. and it's the same contract as a team like the dogs. I feel like they'll pick the dogs because just watching it looks like it's a much better culture to be around. Mm. It's a good point because like it's you're right like the Tigers and Bulldogs were in a way worse position last year but for some reason there's excitement around the clubs. 
Whereas the Dragons, it just doesn't seem like they dro- like can drum up any excitement. Yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot of people saying Dragons will get wooden spoon this year, but I feel like that'll... Like, with Benny Hunt, he's, he's an elite player. It'll mm. be so hard for... I think he'll do an absolute great job again this year. Like, he's just too good. Um, and if you look back three years ago, there was fans saying that we've paid him too much, but I think he's more than fulfilled his contract. Like, he, without him, we would be in absolute shambles right now. I think, um, yeah, I just, I just don't know. I don't know. It's massive. I just think it looks like a culture problem. Um, I actually wanted to ask you guys as well, I think we talked about it with, a bit with the CBA, but the media, as a fan, I can only get information that the media give me. And there's like, I think last year there was a bit of talk or maybe towards the end of the season, there was a bit of talk about conflict between the St. George and Illawarra part of the club. And maybe that's got a problem, but then like Tigers had that problem as well. And they look like you don't hear about that anymore. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it's the, the merger clubs. It feels like, that's a, like for example when the even Bulldogs obviously not a merger club but when you guys struggled the doggies it was because up top he's had one party because isn't part, the fans own some part of it or something like that but anyway there was one side of the board that wanted this and other side of the board wanted this I, I think it is a concern that there's two parties in the Dragons and the Steelers that don't yeah. seem you would probably know a little bit more yeah I mean there is and it's you know we've seen throughout time though like, you can overcome it. The Dragons have done it during periods of time when you get a head figure like Wayne Bennett into the club. I think the Dragons are interesting. I describe them as lacking Dragons DNA at the moment. And you have a look around the league at Ben Hornby's an assistant coach. Jamie Soward's an assistant coach. Dean Young's an assistant coach. you got Jason Rolls. Trent Barrett doesn't have a job. There's a lot of Dragons guys out there. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see. I personally think they'll be looking for a coach in the next three months. Mm. It'll be interesting to see if they go for a Des Hasler or if they go for a Dragons guy. What what is how many games does Hooked have to win in the first six weeks to keep his job? Do you reckon? Soft draw too. Yeah, it's it's good draw for him. Let's go Hell ten man. weeks. We'll go ten weeks. Ten weeks. Five from ten. Would that you reckon that would keep it? Wouldn't surprise me if it doesn't. To be honest with you. Yeah. I, I, I watched them on the weekend. They looked like a team that ran out to me and was going. We're waiting for him to move on. That's what I saw. Fuck. That's sad. That sucks. And they just didn't look motivated. But I get that, mate. Mm. I. Come in here twice a week. Sit next to, <laughs> I sit next to Guru and I think I don't want to be here talking to you for hours on end, but I turn up and I do my job. Don't worry, I feel like Hook. Good God. Can't get anything. <laughs> um, anyone else uh, thoughts in regards to uh, team outside the eight that could potentially make it? I was going to touch on the Dragons. Oh, yeah, touch right? on the Dragons, yeah. I was just going to say, like, um, I think you they actually made... were with the Dragons. Yeah, former club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In- inside Scoop. <laughs> If you just black out my face. Um, I feel like recruitment's their massive drama. Like you look at, compare them to teams in similar boats, i.e. the Dogs and the Tigers had mm. problems. And what they do, they went to market and solved those problems. You know, with your kick outs, your Marnies, your Batemans, your IPAPs, all that jazz. Who was the last big signing that the Dragons went and snatched from another club? Like for me, it was Ben Hunt mm. in like what, 18, 17? Yeah, I think it was 18. I think he's. Yeah, around that Like mark, that was yeah. a long time ago. Mm. You know? And they paid an arm and a leg for it yeah, as well. Yeah, they did. And in the end, in my opinion, like for a long time, it was too much money, but it's paid off now. Like you said, without Hunt, where would they be? Mm. Um, but then on the recruitment front, if I was a player, why would you want to go there when you have no certainty who's going to be a coach? Do you know what I mean? Like, say, that, say, say Kiko had a contract offer from them as well. He knows if I go there, I know Serraldo is a champion, he's a legend bloke. He's going to be there for three years. Mm. You go and meet with Griffin, you're like, yeah, he's all right, but he might not be there next week. You know, like, what was wrong with Nathan Brown? What was wrong with, you know, all the other blokes? Um, yeah, I, I cannot see a world where Griffin's there at the end of the year, which makes recruitment hard. Mm. There goes 23. Let's try again in 24. But you and, haven't recruited for it. Yeah, like... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that my opinion from yeah, no, an outside perspective. It's yeah. a really good point, actually, because for as much, and I, I, you'll probably get your thoughts on it, mate, for as much slack that Mary McGregor got, he could recruit. Like, when there was a period there where they had the most origin players of any team in the comp. And so it's a really good point of like, well, ha- have they improved since they got rid of Mary McGregor and was that even a good decision? Yeah, I feel like Mary got a lot of hate for not much reason, like... That year we had Gareth Witter, Ben Hunt, like we were we were a great side. We had, like you said, six or seven origin players 
Um, we were coming first most of the year. Like we fell, sh we were Gareth Widdop, um shoulder dislocation from going even further. I'd say we lost by one point to Bunnies that year. Like we had a great run, and that was only that was only a few years back, and we just had a massive fall. Um, Mary Mary did a great job with that team, and just he was just a bit unlucky, I'd say, but. To, to cap things off, I, I would love as a Dragons fan if they brought in your Ben Hormies, your Dean Youngs and just built that early 2010 culture mm. um, around like like if they brought some of their mannerisms and, and uh, culture from 2010 into the club now and just built off that. that. As a fan, I'd love to see that. Would you rather that than a Tuvi or a Hasler or someone to come in? Yeah, I feel like... I feel like if you look at Des Hasler, I personally, I look at Des Hasler and think manly. Mm. And I think that as a club, you have to, each club's got their own culture. Um, and I just feel like I would probably rather them risk it with the uh, Dean Young or Ben Hornby, um, just an, one of the old boys than a Des Hasler or a Tuvi. I just feel like um, Tuvi and Hasler might not slot in probably as well as they would. So that's something I find so interesting about the Dragons. There's what, probably eight guys around that are coaching that have won premiership. Shane Flanagan was one of them. Mm. They had him in the building and they let him go. Mm. I just find it bizarre. Ben Hormy's interesting. He punched me in the face in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> it was the slowest punch ever too. So the first night we got there, we were, everyone's excited. Me, him, Josh Miller, all the boys, they like, had a quiet one because it's the first night you don't want to, you don't want to blow your gas tank. You don't want to get again. punched in the face by the halfback. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Benny Hornby, he ripped and teared. So me and Joshy Miller carried him up to his, like, like as in he could still walk, but, you know, he was, he was. <laughs> anyway, we carried him up to his room. <laughs> we opened the door and he go, and he just turned around and goes, fuck you, Kempi. And it was like the <laughs> slowest, it was like the slowest <laughs> punch ever. And he like, he was like, anyway. <laughs> then the next day he gets in the bus, he's like, boys. Well, and he was dusty, dusty. He's like, boys. Don't go too hard, too early. None of is. <laughs> so, so he's um, he's really loved him playing groups, Ben Ormby. And he's, he knows so much about the game. Like, quite an inspirational, quite an under undersung hero of that premiership run. Like, you talk about your Sowards, your Darius Boyds, the forward pack. But Ben Hornby was their leader. Like, he was the guy. And he doesn't really get talked about as much. So I think, like, bringing guys like Dean Young and Ben Hornby back, they – put it this way. When I was down at the Dragons in that top squad – they genuinely had a culture that was specific to them and a DNA that was very specific to them. It was tough. It was there was a lot of banter, a lot of like old school bringing the young guys through. But it was DNA, like it was actual yep. DNA um, of a club. So I think a, a Dean Young and a, and a Benny Hornby would be. Well, yeah, like Dean Young's obviously interesting. You know, his father obviously Craig Young has mm. been part of the Dragons for you know fifty odd years now. So I, I think Dean Young would be the guy that I'd go after. Mm. And he's part of a successful Cowboys setup right now. Yep. You know their their defense is he um, is he the defensive coach? I think so. Yeah. And like their defense is improved out of sight. Um, anyone else with some predictions of outside the eight to potentially move in? Oh, here he yep. is, the shark. He's <laughs> going all mad. Yeah, Nico Hines is hot. We get it. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, maybe I'll take back what I'm about to say. <laughs> uh, I think Brisbane, like. Mm. Manly's the easy answer. I think if Turbo's fit all year, of course. But um, everyone forgets. I think at the end of last year, Carrigan got suspended for that big stretch, and yep. coincidentally, Brisbane went straight down. So I think if they keep Carrigan and Haas on the field all year, uh, I think they'll they'll move into the eight. Pretty sure. Yeah. It's just it's so hard to like the Broncos are tough because like. On their day, when you watch them for a few weeks and they're flying, you're going, oh, my God, this young side is just too explosive, too fast. They almost dominate other packs. But then, like, I feel like, and, you know, you may feel differently, you're always waiting for, oh, okay, they're a young side. Oh, shit, they, they dropped the ball. They got 60% completion. That's the one thing I'm concerned about the Broncos is, like, we're probably going to see patches of the best footy, you know, you can see. But can they do it for a whole year? Like, that's the biggest question that's going to be asked for them, I think. Um, but hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully Reynolds can stay on the field. In saying that, you got cl so close to doing it for a whole year. I know, but it just was like... It just fell off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> it was honestly... I've never seen... It was, it's never happened before. Uh, a club has never been in the top four with like six rounds to go and fallen out of the eight. Oh. So that's a good record to have. Um, 
Anyone else with it's some fun coming in here every Monday? Oh, it's yeah. good time. Oh, I'm dead. <laughs> Enjoyed that. And then you got people saying, "I need to break the curse. I need to get my shirt off, get my kid <laughs> off." Then never knew so many footy fans were uh, superstitious. Jesus, <laughs> bloody hell! Anyone else with some thoughts on outside the eight coming in? Uh, I'll just go back to the Dragons. Sorry to dwell on this. I was still <laughs> no, no. We're talking with yeah, we're talking with Timmy earlier. I think you can't sack someone. You can't sack the coach six weeks in because you're giving him the same problem to a new coach. So at least Fitzgibbon, Fitzgibbon with Sharks was given a whole year. He knew he was getting the job. He could go and approach Nico Hines, who was with the Storm, mm. bring the players across, bring Finucane across, and then he has a foundation which he can work with. You can't – I don't feel it's fair anyway to give him six weeks, sack him, get an interim coach in. Mm. He has the same issue for the year. So do you reckon make this decision earlier? Or oh. give him the year. Yeah, give him the and year. And tell the coach – Maybe July. Yeah, okay. We tell him, all right, get ready for next year. This is who we're giving you. This is the cap that you have. Mm. Give him the details of the club and say, now go out and start speaking to people. Yeah. Have a chat to people off contract. No one at the Broncos, but anyone <laughs> else that is off contract. And then I think give them the foundation to get through. Because we were saying before, you're kind of the same older players mm. into, the, into the year. And mm. then, you, as I said, no foundation again. Yeah, it's a good point. Like you need to give the new coach yeah. an opportunity to bloody build – build a roster for the next year um now let's get on to some some of the biggest talking points in regards to teams uh let's talk about mm, let us talk about dolphins what, what is everyone's thoughts on the dolphins we we don't have any dolphins fans here but i don't think they exist yet <laughs> no, i jest i jest i jest what, what's the thoughts on the dolphins like like and give us honest answers like are you excited about the dolphins being like for example I do feel like when the Titans came in, there was a, quite a bit of buzz. Are you excited about the Dolphins coming in? I would say I'm excited, but just for the fact to have a new team in yep. the comp. I wish the NRL did more to support them coming mm. into the comp and gave them an extra year to recruit. And get. I feel like they just were rushed, in, rushed into the comp. Mm. I don't feel like they were supported by the NRL at all. So I just wish they were given a bit more time because I can't see them getting off the bottom of the ladder. Maybe, what's everyone, maybe the Dragons. What's, everyone th <laughs> what's everyone's thoughts on giving the Dolphins an extra million in the cap or something to be able to pull. Do you think that's unfair? Do you think that's the right thing to start a new club? Don't they do that with like AFL, new yep. AFL franchises? So yep. well, look, I, I'm okay with it because I, yeah, they've had to pull together a squad that's, and a lot of players didn't want to go there because they don't know what they're going to. You mm. know what I mean? So I'm okay with getting a bit of, bit of extra salary cap um, to use on maybe just marquee players just so yep. they can help sign younger guys. Is, is anyone against them getting extra salary cap? Okay. Like, oh, how did you, the Roosters fan just say, <laughs> <laughs> holy crap. How dare you, sir, come into the mecca of rugby league and insult us like that. <laughs> help just fill their back room a bit more because, like, they've got heaps of money still to – throw around at big name players and they still can't sign any big name players, but it would help them fill their depth and their backroom players. And that's where, cause that's actually where I think they're going to be, they're going to really struggle. Cause you look at their side and it's okay. Not too bad. It's about dragon standard, but then, <laughs> then, you, then you look at their, they, their one or two injuries away and then they're just, yep. So yeah, that's where the extra mill or two could have really helped. Agreed. What do you got to say, mate? Oh, this will be interesting. Yeah, so obviously being a Bias Roosters fan. <laughs> <laughs> no, but all the jokes aside, mm. they had all the opportunity to sign a marquee player. Mm. I don't actually think money was a big factor for them because look at the guys that were off contract to move this year. We got one of them with Brandon Smith. There's a reason they didn't choose the Dolphins and they had a full salary cap to go after them. So there's obviously something else that was driving it. And they had the Wayne Bennett. <laughs> well, that's true, but that's Brandon Smith, for example. But you look at Cam Munster, and mm. whilst he wanted to stay loyal, the other guys could have as well. So mm. I think there is a, another side of the argument. I mean, you look back at the Titans, you just mentioned that. They signed Scott Prince, Preston Campbell, Matt Rogers in their first year. So they did pretty well, I think. Um, South Sydney, another one that just joined the comp a few years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> their probably biggest signing was Owen Craig at the time. Uh, Roosters are coming on. <laughs> yeah. But I think Dolphins have had every opportunity. So that's yeah. the only reason I disagree. That I don't know if more money would have helped them. Yeah, okay. It's it, interesting. I think it becomes interesting because I don't think we can have 17 teams forever. Mm. They're going to have to bring in another team. And if the current team with Wayne Bennett, Peter O'Sullivan, and living up there in Queensland, if they couldn't get marquees, What's the next club going to do? 
Mate, I mean, like, for example, let's say assume the next club is New Zealand. Like, that means you've got to get an Australian competition, get, like, mainly in a, well, it is an Australian competition, getting blokes to move. If they weren't willing to move to Redcliffe, like Brizzy, which is a relatively nice place to live, like, are they going to move to Christchurch or... <coughs> What, what was you mentioned before about uh, when they were announced as the NRL's 17th club and then starting obviously in two weeks' time? So, firstly, and if anyone knows what the gap between that was, because it was pretty short, and how that compared Titans. to Titans and any teams before that, because yeah. it did seem really quick and rushed. So, was it shorter than in the I, past? I clubs? remember Titans being quite long. It felt like, you know, it was almost, again, it's, it's so long ago, but it did feel like. Because like when I was, that was basically when I was coming through, the Titans were already talked about as the next club. And we're talking 2005, mm. even maybe six. Yeah. Definitely, definitely by six, there was talks that Titans would be the club. So that might, might be interesting to look into. Like how much time did they have? But I, I do agree with your point that they, they <sighs> did, like they had the conversations with the, the players. The players were off contract. They got offered massive coin. And they were unable to, I guess, I, th I think it's going to be interesting to look at like, especially with the documentary coming out, Stan, guys, Stan documentary coming out, they sponsored the podcast, make sure to watch it, March 6th. Um, I would love to know like, did Wayne handle it in a way that like, because he's had so much success, when he went to Brisbane, he hadn't really done that much in rugby league. So when he's talking to players, he's almost selling the dream and going on it with them. I wonder being Wayne Bennett now, was he quite harsh with the players of like, I've got a standard that I've already set and I want you to meet it. And I wonder if that, he, I wonder how differently he handled Redcliffe and Brisbane and if there was a difference. It'd be really interesting well, to see If that. you go back and have a look at the side he assembled in 88 at Brisbane, mm. look at the side he won his first comp with in 92, there's not many survivors. Mm. There's hardly any. Yeah. There's like, there's like two to three players. So it will be interesting to watch over the next few years. But like, you know, we say the Titans, oh, they got Campbell, they got Scott Prince. You need to remember like, they started in 07, Scott Prince was the premiership winning halfback and Clive Churchill medalist of 05. Mm. Scott Prince had won a Dally M in 01. Luke Bailey was an Australian front rower. Like they, what they did was incredible. Mm. And I sometimes think, have the Dolphins failed miserably? Mm. To did the Titans set a ridiculously high standard we all slept on? By year three, they were a top four team. Yeah, it's crazy. It's unbelievable. And I think as well, like the, uh, maybe the difference with the Titans is that like a lot of good players come from the Gold Coast. <laughs> oh sorry no but like for example when i was coming through it was like myself darius boyd benny hannah was on the gold coast steve michaels coming from the gold. like there were quite a lot of we had two good you got pbc palm beach grumbin and keeper state high who developed like i mean your players are littered all over the place and i wonder like redcliffe do they have maybe one footy school plus they're already competing with broncos that dominate that yeah. that area and it's tough because you compete with the broncos like like keeper now for years has been linked to the Tigers, I believe, like yeah, back in back in the day, Benji's days are with Benji's Tigers, days yeah. are all there, and like so, it's it's hard to come in and all of a sudden be able to make a link to a school, yeah, like that. It's it's a brutal situation. It, it's tough, and I wonder whether, you know, okay, let's say they don't have success in the first couple of years, but are we witnessing similar to what with Brisbane? Because it took them a while to assemble the great side, and maybe Wayne's being smart and setting standards now, so that in five years. And the kids that are impressing us are the Dolphins are the guys we're going to see in three or four years. Mm. Jack Bostock, you've got Tafari. Katoa, Tafare, all these guys that that if you, if they can set culture right over the next two or three years, I think that with Isaiah Katoa they could be really interesting mm. over the next five or ten. I I also think in the Dolphins' defence. The, the footy player today is very different to the footy player, you know, even yep. to 10 years ago. Very different. Imagine like 20, 30 years ago, like, like honestly, if you took a young 18-year-old boy or girl from, you know, 1988 and they had a conversation with a, a young kid coming through now. I mean, we had one kid saying he'd never play for the Broncos ever. Like, that, like <laughs> you know what I mean? That's hectic. What do you got? So Titans were Shit. May 2005. I just did all that research, Maddie. <laughs> oh, you go, you all go. All that man. research. Oh, solely <laughs> thunder. Come out you, of go, Maddie. Nah, go. You go, Timmy. You nah, go, Timmy. I'll be wrong, mate. You go. Uh, May May 2005 was the Titans. They come in 2007. So and, two years. And then the Dolphins was October. So they had about five months more. Mm. It's not that much longer. But in saying that. With four, I, I'm sure they could have done quite a lot in an extra five months. In saying that, if you said to me, would you rather have five months or have Wayne Bennett? 
mm. I would have taken Wayne Bennett every day of the week. And also, would you rather five months in the the Leagues Club that makes and have a hundred million in the bank? Apparently, Redcliffe are like the richest club. Mm. Yeah, look, it's, it's it's it is an interesting situation the Redcliffe Dolphins. Look, I I think that they'll be competitive. I definitely don't think they'll make the eight. Um, What's your your how many wins do they get for the season? Five or six. I'll give them. I'll give them two. Two wins, <laughs> Timmy. <laughs> Holy! I hope I'm wrong, but I, mate, I, I feel so bad beating them up every week. But I just, I'm not seeing good football. So I, mm. I'm seeing a genuine, almost like B grade side. There's no star power, an aging mm. roster, no depth. It's like the in between. Like they've got, you know, a, aging roster, but then also some of the best young talent. But there's no one ready. Like right now, hitting form as a no, kind of superstar. Exactly, player. and then like I, I rave on about every single week about new combinations, how this will impact the Bulldogs, the Tigers, and it takes time. They've got an entirely new squad, not just a new 17, but a new squad. Mm. New blokes come in. They still haven't played together with, with those blokes in the top roster. And I just, I have so many, they will win a, a handful of games playing Wayne Bennett football, and that is grinding away high completions. Might be a wet weather game where they get a complacent opposition who think they're going to walk over them, and they'll just grind away to a win yeah but i just honestly think they're uh, i don't think they've got the points in them to win many games of footy this year I, I genuinely hope i'm wrong yeah uh now on to one of the big signings over the last few days dom young to the roosters <laughs> mate his eyes lit up <laughs> how can you you explain to me how the roosters got dom young we are losing a few players yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're always losing a few players no no we well, do have a couple of players that will actually be leaving probably at the end of the year you think about jared he's probably at the end of his tenure see yep. just left on obviously pretty decent coin but we've filled that with smith mm. um i think tupo is probably on the yeah close to I think one he's of his off last contract this year yeah and he'd be on pretty good money mm. given these ones so many comps and whatnot so dom young we Whilst Tubo's been a great servant, he'll probably take over the Roosters' record this year of most tries. Mm. I think he's gone to that age where, you know, you can chase a few extra dollars overseas. So it's probably the right time for him and probably the right time for us to invest in someone that's so much younger and mm. got so, so much talent as well. So you, you love the signing? I think it's great. Does After what I was, I was probably a lot, there was probably a few people, at, I don't know there's a Knights fan somewhere in here, probably <laughs> on the fence with him at the start of last year. But after seeing him last year, plus the World Cup, where he just absolutely exploded, I don't mm. think anyone was expecting him to do as well as he did in the World Cup. Are you can like because it's it's a fair contract. It's not just like oh yeah, we got him three hundred k. Reportedly around your 500, 600 mark. Are you happy with that? Do you think is is there a chance where he doesn't fulfil his potential? Definitely, there's always a chance. Mm. But the and people love me, uh, especially some people in this room, but <laughs> there's someone out, out that will kick to him every single week and that's Sam Walker. Yep. He'll be there every week to, um, you know, he'll be there on the journey with him because he, they're close to similar age. We've mm. got such a great cr crop of young talent in there. So I think he'll look outside of him and not have to worry too much, especially if he stays on the wing. You think about if he stays outside Joey Manu, he'll be fed the ball every single week. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Knights fan, thoughts on losing a guy like Tom Young? No fighting, no fighting. Well, we've actually lost a few, or we've taken a few of their players when they've been about 40. So <laughs> they're probably, it's only fair that we give them one when they're like 21. So, and, and he doesn't really fit our mould. He's young and talented. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he's probably better off at Sydney. So. <laughs> but no, as soon as... Honestly, as soon as the Roosters come into the race, I was a bit... I knew he was gone. Like, I knew he was gone. What, what I was you, pretty optimistic when all the others were in it, but then yep. as soon as the Roosters come in, I was like, nah. What are your thoughts on the fact that reportedly they didn't... Knights didn't offer him a contract for 10 months, like, at all? Yeah, I, I'm assuming they just didn't really see the... Well, I don't know, because, like, everyone else could see his potential, <laughs> but, like... I don't know. It's nights. No, it's been the age old thing. We let talent go, and mm. um, it's like we could all see it. And then he went to the World Cup and had that boom World Cup. Even the back of his year, though, like he he had that amazing attack, and his defense is his big thing. Mm. But he'll fix that immediately as soon well, as he goes to the Roosters. But what I couldn't understand is like. Let's say, first of all, if they had have offered a contract earlier, they would have got him for way cheaper, way cheaper. But second of all, let's say they offered him 350, 400. 
uh, which which may have been a little bit overs back at the start of last year or even mid last year. But let's say they offered him three fifty four hundred. Are you telling me that let's say it doesn't work out? Dom Young comes out the next year, plays like a busted. Are you telling me there isn't 16 other clubs out there that wouldn't pay half his contract, so 150 minimum for that contract, to get him released from the Knights? Like, I feel like it would have been easy. Like, they would have paid that just for the, his physical attributes. He's six seven and the second fastest top speed in the NRL at the moment. The other thing I find bizarre is that he was he played a big role in getting Kai Pierce Paul mm. and someone help me, the other Englishman's name? Will Price. Will Price, that's it. To the club. He was part of those negotiations. So for Newcastle to then not offer him a contract when you've got those two arriving next year, seems crazy. They're it, trying to shit on you. I wouldn't be surprised if some dominoes fall there. <laughs> It'll be interesting. <laughs> wow. They might end up with the Roosters too. Yeah, stick in the daggers, huh? Yeah. Caitlin Fonga just signed with the Roosters. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what, as the Knights, what, what are your thoughts, KP at six? Yes or no? I personally like that whole move to the whole spine. I actually, for the Knights, I actually, for once, I can actually see a clear path of what they're trying to do. Mm. It may be a bit this year or the next couple a bit jumbled, but for the first time in maybe like two or three years that's, clear identity like they we had a, a like a big immobile forward pack and they've gone and got Adam Elliott they've gone and got Hetherington if he can actually stay on the field <laughs> but they've got rid of Clamour who I think was great but he was big and like pretty slow respectfully but <laughs> and now we've got a bit of a more mobile forward pack and then a spine which we desperately needed mm. Hastings and they've moved Ponga there, which jury's out. But then we went and got a fullback, which jury's still res- kind of out on. But mm. then I think the only other thing that we really need is just depth. Like mm. We're two injuries away from being a basket catch. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, you had something to say, mate? Oh, I was just going to talk about the idea of Dominic Young and what mm. you boys think of it. Obviously, um, it's footy and the idea that like Alex McKinnon brought him over. But what if the same thing happens with Isaiah Katoa? He, they pay the like heaps of money to get him down to Dolphins or up to Dolphins. He kills it, and then Chooks or someone offers him like if a little bit more, but they waste all that time on developing him and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's the age-old you know thing of. I mean, Penrith are going through it right now, and because they're at the top of the table, no one feels sorry for them. But like, it's the age-old thing of do we put all our eggs in this basket only for? Roosters to lay a few eggs and take And it was <laughs> 20 years ago they did the same thing with Brad Fittler. Mm. Chooks took him over. Matt Singh did the same. Like. Is, is there, should clubs be rewarded for developing? What, what do you guys think? Should club be, clubs be rewarded or should there a system be put in place where they are rewarded for developing players? Well, I reckon they should be. But then when you think of it, Penrith have set up this massive system of they've developed all these players, got their Tagos, their Taylor Mays, all these boys coming through and the Crichtons and stuff. Eventually they will have to move on. Mm. But they can use it and have success at the time. Obviously the Dolphins, it doesn't look like that's the case given, as you said, they've got this roster of heaps of older blokes and younger guys as well. It's not really meeting in the middle. Mm. But Penrith, they've got all the younger guys and the Storm do it really well as well. But it's just interesting to see if the other teams are able to replicate it. And but yeah, I think for sure there needs to be like something that goes to those clubs that develop all the younger kids. Well, Alex McKinnon had a great, he, he's obviously a draft. He wants, he thinks the draft would work in the um, NRL, but he actually had a great suggestion <laughs> where he feels the NRL should fully take over the junior side of uh, rugby league. So basically, just imagine an under-20s comp. We'll just say under-20s. It could be anything. But it's completely run by the NRL. So the whole system is owned and run by the NRL. The NRL sells the product onto the networks. And that way, then you could basically have a real clear pathway of like this player was, to, you know, he was a junior all the way through here or he was a junior through there. And then also you would have the draft system because the NRL could take care of all the development of the players. You would have a big pool of players that could be put in together. I actually don't mind that. I mean, if it's a lot of money, so it's it's always easy spending someone else's money and saying the NRL should just spend twenty million dollars on a junior system, but I, I actually wouldn't mind. What that, like that what that also does is it allows uh, benefits to club without messing with the salary cap. So you mentioned the AFL before and about how uh, when clubs like GWS came in and mm. the Gold Coast Suns, 
that I don't know if they gave them more cap space. What I know they did do is give them priority draft picks for mm. like five or so years to come after that. So I was like, you're not tarnishing the cap, but you are giving them a benefit. So that's one way. I know there's a Dolphins for, for one side. You could go, all right, five years, you get the number one draft pick or a top five draft yep. pick or whoever that might be. So it just, it opens things up so much more, doesn't it? How that would impact your junior development. Uh, I don't know exactly, but you're right, Kempi. Mm. It'd make that pathway so much clearer, wouldn't it? Because, like, right now, it's it's quite messy. Like, you don't... I mean, it's it's there is structure. Like, you know, you can get play for the Eels, play Penny Panthers. But, like, it is still... You, you, like, who developed who? Like, some club might say, well, he was here when he was 14 to 16 or whatever, you know? It's messier than what it seems because mm. we're just used to it. Yeah. But it really... It's a shit fight, mm. realistically. Yeah, whereas if the NRL took it over and said, we are taking over the development... As soon as they hit 16 years old, we select 400 16-year-olds that go boom into that area, and then they just come through the pathways. I mean, yeah, it, that 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 would be really sealing our future too. I think like it would really make young people coming through go and girls as well go like it's clear pathway. It's not like oh maybe I go play over there, maybe I go I can stay where I live, mm. and this club hasn't you know I'm straight towards the NRL. Um, any other thoughts on the Knights? Anyone else on the oh, got oh, some. I was going to say about the rewarding, like for bringing up juniors, mm. it's easy to say that, but there are some clubs that would then be disadvantaged with that. Mm. Like, I don't mean to stick up for the Roosters, I never would, but they've got, what, like three junior clubs. So it's a lot harder for them to develop someone from the very bottom. Mm. Um, so you'd have to define, like, by a certain age, do they have to be an SG ball or mm. something like that? Because it's it's not even a level playing field between like Roosters and South, for example. Yeah, to for say sure. For sure. So, yeah. And that's where it does get hard, like from coaching in the South Sydney system. The under-16 comp last year had four teams. You go up to Penrith, they got 14 divisions of eight teams. Yeah, wow. Well. And that's where I think the, the idea from Alex McKinnon of like the NRL coming in and, t and evening the playing field for everyone. And then it actually would help the standard rugby league as well if you had... If the NRL was taking care of every, every bit of development, like think about how much better players would be because there's a clear system in place yep. that they all kind of follow. Just um, quietly, I thought Lockie Miller left the Sharks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dead ringer. I, I will say uh, Lockie Miller, I think he is good enough fullback to be in a top eight side in the sense that like he's not going to be the one that holds them back talent wise from making the top eight, in my opinion. Uh, you know, is he a premiership winning fullback? The jury's still out on that. But I do think he's good enough to be in the top eight side uh, at, at fullback. Uh, now Keep an eye on this shark, by the way. Matty always tells me every Monday that he had a ridiculous argument on Saturday night about favourite red-headed winger that wore a headgear with my sharks, mate, every time <laughs> he says it. And that's you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, now, let's talk about the sharkies. And we'll get open the floor up. Are the Sharkies a premiership threat this year? We'll, we'll speak to the Sharky fan first and then we'll get your thoughts. Yeah, I hope so. Um, <laughs> I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be. Like, I think our squad is slightly better than last year. I think uh, for Feeder and Tolman gone, which they were great, but they were towards the end of their career. Uh, you add Oregon Kafusi and a fit Jack Williams. Um, Royce Hunt's come along a long way. So mm. I think we've improved, but teams may also start to figure out the way we play the way nico is playing um, mm. hopefully not but yeah i don't know i i'm a bit of a pessimist fan sometimes so i don't like to look ahead like that because then you can't get hurt hey bro you exactly. Can take <laughs> exactly so if i expect to lose then it's okay yeah but, but um on squads yeah i think we should be a premiership threat for sure mm. yeah. anyone thoughts on that the sharkies everyone kind of a, feel they are premiership threats i'll just say got, they've got the core pieces in around the leadership group like you look at Dale Fnukin, uh Cam McInnes, Wade mm. Graham um, you look at those sort of guys and you can't not have a good culture I don't think in your, in your team and mm. you can't, the team's always going to be up I think um, to play when you've got those guys leading your team so with those guys as uh, sort of leadership I, I think they'll go well no matter what. Touch wood but like what about the yarn about before Dale Finucane signed, like, oh, he's he's done, you know, his body's breaking down, he's not going to make it through the year. I mean, he played most games last year yep. and he looks it's all about culture. sweet. Yeah, He looks sweet. And that's what I think with the Sharkies too, like, probably outside of Nico Hines, I think anyone could get injured mm. and they can replace them. 
and nothing much changes. Mm. Yeah, only Nick, yeah, you're right. Nico Hines is really the only one that's irreplaceable. Yeah. Like not irreplaceable, but you know what I mean. The big fella here he is. I was just going to say, like they've got the depth as well. They don't only have the core pieces. Yeah, they got strike across the park, and I can't identify a weakness. I don't know what their biggest weak weak link is. So. Um, and they've got the depth to step in if someone gets injured as well. So. Well, well, you got guys like Iro, Dykes obviously got e- It's injured. the best 30 in the comp, in my opinion. You reckon? Yeah. Even better than Penrith? I, I think so. Player for player, you go all the way through it. Like You've got guys like Connor Tracy that aren't in their top 20. You've mm. got Iros, you've got like Trindle, yeah. Hazeltons, all these guys. The Peru guy coming through. Peru, uh, who was the fullback last week? Yeah, like yeah. Anderson. Like, there's, there's so many guys in this team that can't make it. Mm. And Sifatalakai was a bench middle last year. Mm. He's now a starting centre. Who, sorry? Yeah. yeah. Like they've yeah. lost Dykes, Miller. And they're sweet. Anyone worried about them? Yeah, it's crazy. It's uh, I just can't believe how quickly they've turned it around. Like, yeah. what was it, two years ago where you were struggling to make the eight? And now, like, your squad is, the depth is insane. Have you got the mic there? Yeah, there was the... Uh, two seasons ago, we we just missed the eight on four and against. Mm. Titans pipped us on the last game <laughs> of the year, sadly, but um, good for them. Uh, but yeah, other than that, we've been in the finals pretty much every year. But there was we were out week one um, both the years previous to that as well. Mm. So I feel like last year was a big change with Fitzy and mm. the culture with Fanuka and McInnes, and then players like Ronaldo and that are literally turning into the elite of the comp as well yeah. that have just come through us down like from our lower rank so yeah it's a good time to be a shark fan <laughs> um it's exciting as and your seven is hot as anything um <laughs> now who who's more likely to win a premiership cowboys or sharks this year i'll throw it do you need to ask me that <laughs> sharks? sharks for sure yeah. Bruce it's robson's about Bruce. to punch in the back of the <laughs> <laughs> As the hooker, I think Toddy Payne would be dirty if I said the, uh, <laughs> the Sharks. Yeah, the, the, the Sharks were so good on the weekend, I thought. Like, obviously, Cows went down to the Bronx. But yeah, just both. Oh, I'm with Guru. I think they've both got better squads than the, than the Panthers now. And obviously, you know, the jury's out on the Panthers with Sonny Luke to come back and mm. Dill Edwards and uh, Liam Martin and stuff. But I think balance-wise, I personally mm. think balance and talent, best two squads. In the comp is yeah sharkies and cows my opinion mm, it's incredible how quickly they've turned that around like again it was two years ago and there's no way you'd be sitting there going oh how good's the depth of the sharks 12 the months ago you hit no, and now all of a sudden it's yeah. like you don't i mean you are worried about injury you don't want your top seven to get injured but i don't think anyone's sitting there going oh man if we lose three or four players we are done we are done um Kempi, Corey and i uh come through school together this year above me jake over the back there as well played as well and mm. one of the hardest blokes i've ever played footy with him and i lining up just used to fly and just whack the biggest <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah. biggest blokes in sydney uh, together. yeah yeah we I'm just sure. yeah, look at each other and just line blokes up and <laughs> we say <laughs> whack him <laughs> whack him but uh Corey, uh <laughs> yeah, come from one of the softest blokes I've ever played footy with. <laughs> but uh, these boys and Corey came through Jimmy Tedesco's year at school. Oh, so okay. you probably would have played with him from what, year seven or something, did you? Uh, yeah. I didn't go to Greg's until year 10, but Teddy and I are the same age and you know, played at um, rugby at Camden and league at Camden and stuff like that. And Wes, Harold Matz and stuff like that. What was a lot coming through with him from through school or older grades? Teddy, yeah. So Teddy was one year above me at school, but like I said, same age. Um, just unbelievable to yeah. play with like he was a bloke that was just so talented like a lot of people don't know about teddy he was like an athletics champion when he was like super young like he was so fast um and then he was a good cricketer um and yeah league wise he was just a bloke that you always hear that yarn in the sheds about you looking around geez it's gonna be tough today and you'd see teddy pulling on his you know jersey it'd be a six or a one and you go oh, we might be all right here today <laughs> like he just just had a bag of tricks, mate, you know? Mm. Yeah, you just get, get Was he a crazy trouble. tackle breaker back then too? Yeah, he's, his ability to change directions has improved with, like, everyone's aware that he's sort of changed his running style when mm. he runs different now. But he has just always turned on a dime, rapid acceleration. Yep. Um, and he didn't get big till 20, yeah, 20, okay. 1920 yeah. when he was in the Tiger system, he just jacked up. Yep. But prior to that, he was just a little bean pole. Yeah, but yeah, wow. your team... You know, we were playing against Paddy's Blacktown and stuff like that. Blokes like um, yeah, Matty, Matty Lodge, for example, was playing there. And mm. Teddy would get, sort of go over him with those powerful hips. Oh, wow. Um, oh, yeah. And he'd go, geez, where's that come from? But you, you see it again today. And mm. um, 
on Teddy, though, yeah, always the hardest worker in the room, so deserves anything he gets. I, I remember being at a trial. It was Teddy's first trial that he played for the Tigers, and there'd been a lot of talk about him. It was the year Braithen Astor had gone over there. Mm. I remember we were at, like, it was at, like, Camden or something, and Braithen Astor was walking through, and no one was around Braith, and then Teddy walked out. It, uh, no one knew who he was, and the crowd around him was un. Believable. Really? They were just following him everywhere he went. I'll, I'll never forget it. And think, and at that point, I didn't know who he was either. Mm. Looked mm. at the thing and saw this James Tedesco. Then he played, and you just went, "Fuck, he's something different." Yeah, wow, well, far out, destined for greatness. Now he's, I would argue, he's one of the most consistent players of all time, without a doubt. Like he, like put it this way, he, the trial on the weekend was the worst game, arguably the worst game I've seen him play, and like he didn't even play that bad. It's just uh, like I. I don't know how he does it. Year in, year out, puts yeah. in these crazy efforts. Well, he's been at the Roosters now five years. And that's five, five Jack Gibson medals. <laughs> that's insane. Have I, a year off. Chill. Yeah. Just relax, <laughs> bro. Seriously. <laughs> Just relax, mate. Um, let's talk about uh, the mighty para eels. The mighty para eels. Uh, para, para? Para as well? All right. Do you think you... Have, will feel the loss of a guy like Reed Marnie, Isaiah Papali'i. Do you think you have the squad this year to win the premiership or do you think your window has closed? Oh, I mean, I'll go first. Mm. Um, well, I wanted to touch on, I want to get your guys' opinion on it first. So obviously it's not as bad as others, but I want to talk about our, like the retention of those key players and everything like that. So obviously losing Papali'i, I kind of felt that more than losing Marnie. Mm. Um, but I felt like obviously he got, what, he was second row of the year the year before mm. and then we try and low ball him and give him unders and then he signed somewhere else so i was like kind of like all right but um i mean this year i feel like our bench is stronger than last year because obviously like hop good coming over that gives like maddo a break um but yeah i don't think i wouldn't say close but obviously going in every year it's, it's always like every year oh we're gonna break the drought we're gonna do this we're gonna do that but i wouldn't say close but i mean i'd say similar squad obviously losing those players obviously not good but I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say closed. I think uh, in regards to like retention and that, I think they've shown a real, like, you could have looked at Papali Ian being like one hit wonder in the sense of, oh, Eels just got lucky that they got this guy from the Warriors that just somehow turned into the best back row on the comp. But I think with the recruitment of Hopgood, it shows the Eels have a real eye for that, that player. Because like Hopgood's come in and already impacted the squad. Mm -hmm. And so seeing that, it actually gives me a lot of confidence in, in Eel's ability to just push through this window per se and not go from like, you know, Eels of yesteryear would like go on this crazy run and then be bad for four or five years. Now I feel like at the moment they've got the good systems in place and a really good eye for talent. And it's tough. As you said, you know, they lowballed um, Isaiah Papaliti and, you know, if they won one more game last year, everyone's going, wow, what a system Parramatta is. They don't pay overs for guys, but because they've won that premiership yet, you're still going, geez, why aren't they keeping iPad? Mm. The, the narrative flips very quickly mm. if they had that game. And I, I know that's a big step, but I, I, at times I understand what Parramatta's <coughs> doing. There's a lot of times that I've got a lot of question marks <coughs> around it still. But I also think that you've lost players, but I think the experience that your Dill Browns, your Mitch Moses, these sort of guys have gained from last year. And I know it was only a trial on the weekend, but... Fuck, Mitch Moses looked confident the other day. And I just feel like every year he just gets slightly better. And has, has that been confirmed that he's staying or is that just rumoured at the moment? Well, it's. I mean, I'd be shocked if he doesn't stay. Yeah, so would I, yeah. So I I don't think it's closed. And last year I would have said to you if Reid leaves, it probably is closed, but I don't think it is now. What are your thoughts on the Eels this year? Um, I don't think it's closed. I'm probably – I'm really excited for Hodjo. I think, like, off the field he'll have a really great mm. impact. I'm probably a little bit concerned whether he can do the full season. Mm. I, I'm not sure. We've got Mitch Rain, I guess. Yep. But otherwise, I'm not sure who else we might have there. Mm. Um, Hopgood, I'm super, super excited about. I think um, he really just had a lot of rep players above him. Otherwise, he would have a break at Penrith. So mm. I'm really excited for him there. Um, losing Papali'i is big. But I'm excited for Murchie. I think he'll be good. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, we could potentially do with him what we've done with Papali'i, which is mm. just turn him into a gun player, really. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it, you're right in regards to Hopgood. Like, he's behind the best 13 in the comp, essentially. Like, so I actually think uh, – I think I actually think Marnie's a bigger loss than Papali'i because I think that you guys have such a big forward pack and strong forward pack that you'd be able to cover it. Don't get me wrong, he's still definitely a loss. 
it, I think it all hinges on, because I, I think Hopgood actually adds something to your forward pack that you haven't had for, co- for quite a few years. Like you haven't had a ball playing 13, like, fuck. When was people talk about Matto like he is, but he really is. He's not, not he's the not. way that he plays. No, I don't think Matto. he's yeah. he, he can ball play, but he's not like Isaiah Yo yeah. out the back link man. He's more forward to forward ball playing, kind of yeah. like the Bulldogs when they introduced the their front rowers tipping on. I think he could, but that's not the role they've given him. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, I wonder like he, he is so explosive in a big body would he be wasted as that ball player? And, and I suppose the difference like in terms of having that genuine ball playing lock they're also gifted with Junior Bolo, who's one of the mm. best. Well, would you say he's the best ball playing front rower in the competition? Yeah, like, for sure. Exceptional. Like their ball movement from one side to the other is as good as anyone's in the NRL. And mm. yeah, they don't have that direct ball playing lock as such, but geez, they've got some other boys in there who can move it around well. Yeah. Oh. And like, I mean, last year, I know I don't want to go into the past too much, but Reed Marnie had the best service from dummy half. So how is that going to be without Reed there? Hodge's mm. got good ball service, but it's nothing on. Marnie. I don't think anyone's got anything on Marnie. No, and that yeah, and that's nothing against Hodger. No, Marnie's not at all. the best of the not best. Yeah. Hopefully, what they he lacks in, let's say he just plays solidly. Hopefully, that he can make up for it with his experience off the field. You know, hopefully which I think he will. Yeah, 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 for sure. Anything more on the Eels? Um, one thing, sort of on the Eels still, but with Junes and RCG obviously coming off like a really big um, World Cup. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think they played pretty well in the trials. They, they had some good minutes there. Mm. But do you think that's going to affect anything throughout the season with some of those boys who have had quite a short preseason? Yeah, it's going to be interesting, like, because they're going to have to balance. They don't want to burn the boys out as well. Like, they don't want, you know, them getting halfway through the year and being like, man, I am tired. But at the same time, you don't want to be underdone and get injuries and soft tissue, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a really tough balance. And it's like, it's one of the unsung or one of the not talked about things that the Melbourne Storm handle really well, the Roosters handle really well. I think the Eels will handle it okay because they, they have been willing to like change up. Like for example, I spoke to Junior last year and I was like, what are you, you going to do about your end of year fade off? Like what, what are you going to do this year that's different? And apparently they completely changed their um, training program. They completely changed the way they train so that coming into finals that they would start peaking. So I think they're aware of it, it's, but sometimes players just have down years, like, you know, and I'm not saying that Junior or RCG will, but like sometimes players are just tired, like they're just, their body's banged up, they need a reconstruction or whatever it is, but it is, it's definitely going to be a challenge, I think, for oh, sure. Oh, I think it'll have a big impact this year. You've also, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but you're also extending the season mm. by two weeks or, or whatever it is. So that on top of when, you're, when you're at the end of a season playing NRL, you are just like, mate, I am done. Especially your teams that go deep into finals, go to a World Cup, come back, start. Origin as well. Com, origin smack in the middle of it. I, I think it'll be interesting to see how clubs do handle it. Like we obviously do a lot of uh, um, super coach stuff and you sit there and go, this guy will definitely play 80. You go, Can he play 80 all year? Mm. Realistically, is that the best thing for the longevity of his body? When you consider like, the big guys last year that played 35 games of footy. Mm, crazy. Which is crazy. And you look at Penrith in particular, like it would be the first side since Parra to go the treble. Mm. And I mean, I think they're, they're starting the season as favourites. Nearly their entire side was in the World Cup up to the final between Samoa yeah. and Australia. It's true. Add two rounds to it, back to back premiers. Like that will be a mammoth task for them mm. to do it again. Uh, I think Junior last year played the most minutes of any player or something, didn't he? Or any forward? Be up prop, maybe. He yeah. played the most games of any player. Of any player. Oh, right. Um, so it's a great point, like managing those big, bo- especially bigger bodies as well. Um, You'll have Madison fresh though. Yeah, Matto. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on Matto saying I'd rather sit out three weeks? And <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> I mean, obviously it's not great, but I feel like they got him not at a great time. Like mm. it was just off the back of the grand final, right? So. Mm. He's probably had a few schooners. <laughs> a few schooners. Um, <laughs> and then he obviously didn't think it was fair, so he's gone, well, no, stuff that. I'm not paying for that. And mm. then maybe later on has been like, oh, Whoops. actually, that's probably not a great call. Well, yeah, I mean, I thought, like, at the time seeing it, I was kind of – I could be just completely, like, paragoggles on, like, bias. I didn't think it was a suspension worth. But, I mean, obviously, when you get it, you've got to kind of cop it on the chin. But And obviously – what instead of taking like the smallest portion out of his salary to 
played the first three games and said, he goes, no, nah, I've got like other things to look out for. Mm. And then suddenly when he, everyone gets on his back, he tries to backflip on it. It's kind of like, I know it's just like everyone said, I think you guys have mentioned it, like a bit of a kick in the teeth for the rest of the team. Like how everyone sees like, oh, like he's not there for the boys kind of thing. Like he's willing to have three weeks off and not focus on the team. Like hit the ground running sort of thing. I don't know that kind of, that annoyed me. I'm sure like other para fans felt the same and I'm sure other teams would feel the same if one of their star players from the season before decides to take three weeks off instead of paying a small yeah, fine. It's, it's like, uh, cause I, like I've met Maddo and I just, I think that he was like almost, and I don't know for sure, but I think he was almost like making a stand of like, why are we paying these massive fines? And it's, I know it's not massive for the contracts they're on. Like, it's unfair that we have to like i've got to pay money to to play footy but i i think he just probably just as you kind of suggested like he probably wasn't thinking like it was so far away this season sometimes you're not you're just not thinking about that and then as it gets closer you start going oh my god like i'm actually not going to play um isn't it funny how it's played out like yes he's now more of a middle forward but then lane gets injured <laughs> IPAP's gone. They are desperate for an edge back row. Oh, man. If only they had one. It's rugby league down to a T. Oh, <laughs> it's always yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the Rabbitohs. The Rabbitohs. How are we feeling about the Rabbitohs? Do we are we do we think that they can go one further? Do we think that they're a bit un like, for example, if they had finished that first half off a good good against Panthers last year. There's a real world where they get the win. They were up 12 nil with like five to go in the first half. Do you think they can go further this year? I, I do. I do. I think that, you know, it's been five years in a row going grand final or prelim. Mm. Um, so I really do hope that they can go, you know, at least one better. Mm. Um, in saying that, it's a really settled squad. They've, they feel like, you know, they've been... They, they know what they've got to do. Yeah. Um, I think Demetrio has been really good for the team, especially coming off the back of Wayne Bennett. Mm. I think he sort of brought in a little bit more of a, um, not that, not that Wayne didn't do this, but like he, he's really sort of galvanized them against the media and that kind of thing. Mm. Definitely doesn't feel the same as they, um, as they did in the past under Seabold and, um, you know, match before that. Mm. I think, the only thing that worries me is, yeah, just guys like, um, you know, Cam Murray, Damien Cook, these guys have, who have played huge amounts of football over the last five years. Yeah. It's like, can they hold up? And like, mm. they're not necessarily the biggest bodies yep. and that kind of thing. And they really need guys like uh, Latrell and everything to sort of really step in and sort of take on leadership roles as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, I, I, I've got high hopes for them this year. I mean, it's, but it's hard to stay up at that sort of level for so long. Yeah. And I think, you know, for Souths, like they brought on along, they brought, brought along a lot, a lot of um, younger players sort of really slowly at mm. the moment and they haven't really had places for them to go. So I think it's sort of, it'll be really interesting over the next couple of years um, this year as well uh, to see sort of how they do develop their younger talent and that kind of thing. Did, were you, cause like, I, I'll be honest, I didn't feel Dimitri was gonna have success first year. And like, I was totally wrong, like totally wrong. And I, I think he deserves, he's a, essentially the only coach post Wayne Bennett that has been able to keep the side together and playing really good footy. Were you a believer before this year? Well, I was under the impression that like the last two years under Wayne, Dimitri was pretty much running the show anyway. Okay. And Wayne was sort of just being that sort of figurehead kind of thing, mm. really putting on the finishing touches to the sort of game plans and that kind of thing. But it was pretty much Dimitri carrying it through. Yeah. And I think they're going to try something really similar up at Redcliffe. Okay. Um, or the, um, where they do uh, <laughs> have Christian Wolf there as well. So I think that's sort of, um, that'll be interesting how they go up there. But yeah, I, 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 I had faith from the start. Yeah. I, th I thought, you know, I thought Renault would be a bigger loss than Wayne. And I think he probably was in the end, mm. um, which is a massive call when it's Wayne Bennett, you know? Yeah. Um, do you think they made the right call with Renault and they, like, the decision to get Lockie Elias in there at seven was the right, like, obviously, I personally think, like, it's pretty clear it was the right call. Like, they're, they're still playing good for you. But do you think they could have maybe squeezed another year out of Renault? I, th I think it, it comes it comes down to what the cost is. Like mm. if you you know you do that and you lose your Mamas Ellis and your Davy Mowalis and these sort of guys that are coming through, mm. and you've put all the time into them in the junior grades, is it worth it? And I mean, Souths have always been, a, or at least for the last sort of ten years, they've been a team that sort of focused on the long term success of the club and that mm. kind of thing as well, rather than 
sort of really sinking everything into the next year or 18 months. Yeah. So I think that's probably where they were coming from with um with with Renault. And I mean, I've got, he's one of my favorite ever Rabbitohs. So it's like, you know, he brought all the success when he came in, you know. Man, I, I'll be honest, I was wrong about that too. <laughs> I was like... We didn't get much right with the bunnies. Yeah, bunnies, Precious. I was so wrong. Like I, I thought bunnies, there was a... I, st I think I still had them in my eight, but I thought there was a real chance it was going to be a disaster. And I thought that getting rid of Reynolds was, it was you know... You know, just let Lockie Elias wait a year or two. 100% wrong. I think Lockie, I think it was the right call for both parties. Like, Renault obviously brings a lot to Brisbane. But Lockie Elias looks like a halfback for the next 10 years. And if you would have said to me, one Rabbitohs running out for the Dolphins in round one, I would have laughed at you. Mm. Mark Nichols. Mm. Count Cody Nicarima if you want. He was a mid-season guy. For, for the coach to keep Mark, to only lose Mark Nichols yeah. to Wayne Bennett, you think about when the Dragons won the comp, what are we talking? Bo Scott. Jeremy um, Smith, Jeremy Smith, Darius Boyd, Alex McKinnon, like mm. it's an incredible knock. I think what the coach has done at South mm. Sydney. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, now, the Titans. Let's talk about the mighty Titans. Have you finally sorted out your nine and your thirteen? How are you feeling going into this year? Yeah, mate. Look, I'm heaps higher than this year. Last year, I feel actually <laughs> nah. I feel like last year, <laughs> last year. <laughs> Everyone was high on him and it was like, I couldn't see why. We were yeah, so okay. disjointed. Had Toby there. Had AJ at six. Like, why? Mm. But this year, we've put AJ back at fullback. Got four in at six, thank God. Mm. And then hopefully go with Tanner Boyd there. I just think if they can th sort out what happens at 13. I know Guru's pretty high on putting Aaron Clark there. I actually quite like having Isaac Lou there. Mm. And then putting... I don't like Jaden Campbell at 14. If okay. we can put Aaron Clark at, at, at 14, he can come play some... Um, nine if need be I know Sam Farrells is a 80 minute hookup but as you said as the season goes on blah blah he can also then come in play 13 when the sting's taken out of the game play through the middle link up with Tino mm. Jermaine Jolliffe all those boys Mo Fonna Waker play out the back like I reckon there's a massive chance this year of doing something where would you play Jaden Campbell Jaden Cam I wouldn't play him would you be willing to lose him yeah yeah. For sure. How, how AJ would only be about 27, 26. Not even that. I think not even. Yeah. I reckon he's like a long term fullback. Yeah, okay. Because like Campbell's so good that I think a lot of clubs will have a bite at him. There'll be a long line. You wouldn't chuck him at centre or something just to get him in the side? Or? Wait, no. like we've got Brian Kelly, who yep. I'm massive on. I reckon he's a gun. Um, shot, weapon. And then like if we can sort out the Dave for feeder issues. If we can sort out the David for feeder issues of getting him to run through the line, not just trying to get the ball and bounce over it himself, with um, Tanner Boyd there and Foz, I reckon he can sort that out, give AJ some space, link up with shot, like he can bounce, set up um, for feeder. I reckon looking good this year. Oh, I, I agree with your the thought process. Like I think the Titans need to make a call on Campbell. Like. Mm. I think that th this 14 role, he's just not suited for it. Like, and look, I'm happy to say I was wrong and he comes and he becomes the best 14 in the comp. There's a, there's a world where that happens because he's so talented. But I think like it's best for both parties. I do think that Jaden Campbell is a first, try first grader fullback that should be playing fullback every week. And I think the Titans are probably gonna have to bite the bullet, whether it is moving AJ to six and putting Campbell back or saying, Campbell, look, mate, you're gonna be 14 if you're here. Camp, like Brimo has to be number one, um, so I under, I definitely understand that thinking. I think they need to make a decision for sure. Yeah, because um, yeah, if they did play him at fourteen, they can't put him in through the middle. Mm. He's probably like eighty kilos dripping wet. Like mm. he can't go anywhere. You know what I mean? They're not going to take Sam Ferrells off for him. Does he even want to play at fourteen? You know what I mean? Like I think he's such a good player. There's got to be another NRL club that would love to have him at fir first grade, week in week out. Can I ask you, if you were to take Jaden Campbell and get him in like a swap deal somewhere, what sort of a position or player would you be targeting? Like, where, where, what, what do you think your side lacks? I don't know. I think it's not to bring it up to the Dragons again, but I feel I look, at the, so I look at the Dragons as just like just 13 average footballers. Like, but like our, our, our backs, I sort of look at a bit like that. Like sometimes we've got Phil Sammy who can, like good player, played origin, but... Can he go to that next level, mm. bring us a comp? Like, I don't think so. But then when you say Jaden Campbell, we ideally need a seven. But he's not going to bring us a Mitch Moses or a, one of the other big guys in the competition. So maybe probably another, like like a, maybe another prop. Yeah, prop. I was going to say prop. Yeah. I think he's going to need another prop. God, it's going to be tough watching, you know, Preston Campbell's son dominating somewhere else. Because he will, he'll years. kill it. It's going to be tough. But Brimo's just too good. Yeah. He's just 
just interested. Who do you think's a better 14, Jaden Campbell or Tanner Boyd? Paul, Boyd? I'd have Tanner Boyd starting. So Tanner Boyd would start for me, and I'd agree with you. I'd either have Liu or Clark at 14. Because, yeah, I reckon um, Aaron Clark at 14 is just such a good option with three big front rowers like um, Lou, Tino, and then Jamin Jolliffe. He's so underrated. He's been so underrated for so many years now. Mm. He's actually finally getting a good crack. Yeah. Those three at the front, they just go so hard. Mm. Aaron Clark comes in, plays like Dylan Walker, <laughs> just tears them up through the middle, links up with them. Sam Verrill as well. I reckon they'll actually be... Give it actually a crack this year. Do you reckon they could sneak into the eight? Honestly, yeah, for yeah. sure. Like what six to eight? That yeah, yeah, no higher, and probably couldn't win a comp this year. Yeah, but um, yeah, I think they're not getting as much credit because last year everyone was so high on them for no reason. They were so disjointed, but yeah. this year they're actually like looking like they could give it a crack. I could you beef up Campbell and put him in six and put four into seven? He's little, man. Like, he's a, he's a little frame. And you wouldn't want to take away what's... Like, a big issue I had with, like, when I was playing is, like, they always tried to beef me up. And, like, I, I was never going to be stronger than the strongest guys on the field. I was never going to be bigger. I was never going to win every bit of contact. But the one thing I could do was be faster and have better footwork. But they were, like, trying to, like, bring me up to... Like, you know, for example, like when I played my best footy, I was 82 kilos. Um, whereas they were trying to get me to, like, 87, 90 so Which, what would what would Campbell be now, mate? He'd be so small. I don't even reckon he'd be eighty. Honestly, he's a small body, and it, like, so I just, I personally think he's an out and out fullback, and I reckon there'd be plenty of clubs right now that like for like I I would honestly put him on. There was a period there where I thought that he potentially would have may have more upside than Reese Walsh. Now Reese Walsh has kicked on to do what he's doing, and there's still parts of Reese Walsh's game that needs to be fixed up. But I I, I think Jaden Campbell's potential is. Mental, mental. 80 uh, kilos. 80 kilos, yep. See, that, that's what's on the site? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's probably. It's, it's probably yeah. lighter. It's probably lighter. It's, probably uh, I, it's one of my gripes is when they take these tiny little fullbacks and maybe they, they just, even defensively, they're just thinking we need to bulk them up, just mm. more solid defence on the line, that last man. I look back to Anthony Milford at the Raiders, Ben Barb at the Doggies, their best years in the NRL were their first couple of years when they were tiny. Yeah, yeah. I understand why the clubs do it, but I just it's my gripe. And Jaden Campbell, if they do it to him, I think he's going to lose his biggest asset, and that's his speed. Yeah. He'll still be quick, but he won't be what he is now. Well, just I'm with you. I think he's just an out-and-out out fullback. Out-and-out fullback. I, th I actually think, and it hasn't been spoken much, I think KP's too big for his body. And I think that when he came into grade, he was skinny as... Like, he was a touch player. And I think he's actually put too much muscle mass... Uh, on for how good he is in like look I'm no physio like so this is just armchair stuff but me personally when I put a lot of weight on I, I went through from when I was four years old all the way up to playing NRL never strained a calf done a hammy nothing never like literally ne like my body was quite balanced as soon as I got to about 87 90 kilos boom hammy gone like and a big tear too and it was all because I had too much weight on my body like I had just way too much muscle mass and weight um and obviously that's changed now if I could way heavier uh, <laughs> but yeah so I think with the Campbell situation just let him do what he does man I think with what you with what Guru said with Campbell could you play him at center and defend in the front line I reckon he's tough enough for it he's definitely he tough enough but he's just you would almost guarantee yourself a quick play the ball on him which and it's no disrespect to Jaden because like bloke's got plenty of quick play the balls on me so it's not I'm not sitting here saying I was fucking Manu Vatavai on the wing jamming bloke because I definitely wasn't um but it would just be too much of a spot like you'd be doing video sessions and the whole play like let's say Broncos are playing Titans their whole sets would just be going straight down his edge when um Brian Kelly comes back do you think he takes the spot over Phil Summy? oh Brian like the 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 Titans' backs are so straight, hard to, to gauge because, like, Brian Kelly will come out and literally play like this kid could play Origin, and that's I'm not even being hyperbolic. Like, he has games where you're going, "Oh my god!" Every single one of their backline players has this potential, but constantly sit here. Yeah, it's bizarre. Like they, they sit there for half a decade. It's they have like this crazy game, yeah. or in attack they'll be incredible for half the year, but then you look at their defense and like their reads are poor, and and it's so. It's really hard to say. I will say um, Khan Pereira looks quite exciting on the wing. I think he'll probably jag a wing spot, potentially. Um, Khan's getting the, the pre-season hype. How looks oh. Jojo looking as well? Jo well? Jojo gun, Khan gun. So, again, like, the, the thing with the Titans is it's quite – you don't have 
like a lot of other clubs struggle for depth in the outside backs. Like look at the Tigers right now, like probably not that much depth in the outside backs and they're still trying to figure out. Whereas Titans, like they're almost letting backs go. Well, like you have looked through their whole squad, like you've got Mo Fodawaka coming off the bench. I was sitting here two years ago going, he's going to be the best front row on the comp in yeah. two years. Yeah. So there's definitely potential there with the Titans. Like, I, I look, put it this way, like I, I don't have them pushing into the eight, but I absolutely wouldn't be surprised if they did push into the eight. With Kieran Foran, Kieran Foran and Verrills, I actually think Verrills would be one of the most underrated signings of the year. I think he, I think actually, I I would go as far to say I was surprised that they got Cheese for Verrills because Verrills is way cheaper. Like obviously, like Cheese is, I think he's a better player, but Verrills would have been on fucking... Oh, the service Verrills gave gives out a dummy half is invaluable to any side. So mm. I think he'll be fantastic for you guys. But he went through a few injury years at yeah. the Roosters. I think that's probably the main thing. And when you get someone like Cheese on the go, I think that's yep. a big success. But I think he'll do really well. But my issue for the Titans is David Fafita. Like, it's so frustrating watching from a neutral fan. I'm a big fan of his. But, like, if you're inside their 20-metre line and you're not giving him the ball at least once a set, it is just infuriating. And especially... Yeah. Watching the trial on the weekend, you think they've had a whole preseason. This is their time to unleash him. He didn't touch the ball in the f- second half of the first 20 odd minutes, and then he picked it up and ran 60 meters to set up the second try. Like, mm. see, so yeah, I like the way. I know this is very controversial as well. I actually like the way they do use Dave Fafita at times, especially coming to the, out of their own end. We're a type of team like Manly, like the Storm, that can throw the ball around. If he holds his width, that allows us our our like back five get out of out of our own end and then if he comes in we're able to shift it they compress and we got an overlap early mm. i think that's so underutilized in the nrl as well shifting it out of your own 20 even yeah i think in fafita the situation's hard for fafita because part of it is his fault like not going in and getting carries but also he's had a million different halves pairings like th- these things take time like the, it takes time to get the timing of like what, what I've actually liked about Fafita's trial games, although, you know, we, he can always get a little bit more involved. But when you look at the number of runs he's had, it's quite high. But also the way he's running, he's taken, like, hit-ups, like straight straight line hit-ups. Whereas, like, you know, put it this way, last year I was saying they should put him in the front row just to get him through 20 hit-ups and run straight. Um, I, the, Fafita's an interesting one because, like, put it this way, would, if Fafita was on 600K, would you be as frustrated? No, definitely not. But yeah. if he's on the big money and – but he's got so much potential. Yeah. That's that's the annoying yeah, thing. Yeah, for sure. Like, for sure. He, he reminds me a lot of – not to shit on South, even though I'd love to, um, <laughs> <laughs> all podcasts, but um, he reminds Put me a lot of – Put your feet up, like, Dragon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he reminds me a lot of what Latrell used to do. Like, mm. just sits back and just, you know, he ends up with three runs for the whole 80 minutes, even though he does a whole bunch of flashy stuff, but he has three runs. Mm. You, like, you want a bit more from him, even though he has the highlights. Mm. So that's why I just see very similar traits in between those two players. Mm. I think Trell, like, Trell's a match winner. Like, the amount of games that he won for you. But you're right in regard, even I would say, like, sometimes I wish Trell would just tuck the ball and fucking just go. What, what about your, with Trell? What, what are your thoughts on Trell? Like, I tell you what, I love Trell and he's so talented. But do you feel sometimes that you just wish he would just go for it or do you love the way he plays perfect? No, I like the way he goes because, yep. like, I don't know, watch the Charity Shield on the weekend and it was, I think he touched the ball about eight times, but he scores a try, crashes over, mm. puts another player over and, you know, I'd rather him do that than take 30 runs and do none of the other stuff, you know. So. Do you reckon there could be a balance though? Like, do you reckon, because, like, I agree with you in regards to, like, I, I, it's, I'm not saying he plays poorly at all because he doesn't. Like, he has minimal touches, but every touch is incredible. Like, every touch you're going, oh, my God. But I do. if we could just get, like, three or four big runs out of him i reckon it would take he's already at the tippity top but i, I it almost like <clears throat> honestly maybe hyperbolic because i think greg Inglis is the best outside back of all time but if he added that to his game that would put latrell for me as probably the best outside like because latrell has the same physicality as gi did but i would argue latrell has better ball playing than than gi does without um, a doubt mm. yeah and so i well, I think that like Latrell has even more potential in his You always game. want someone to leave you wanting more, though. Yeah, you know? sure, yeah. Sure. Come on. <laughs> just, it, you go, mate. I've got. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, yeah. Um, yeah. So like that. That's being super. Like that's me saying that like Latrell could be one of the best backs we've ever seen. What he's only <laughs> twenty five years old, but some of the stuff he does is absolutely amazing. Back to the times. The one, when I think of Latrell, the one thing, his attack's unreal. Mm. I just think his goal line D is just so not up to scratch for a fullback. Mm. He's a weapon, like one of the best deserves to be on a million a year. Yeah. 
But like, there's so many times where like teams will just put a grabber in second row or center, just come and scores. Mm. It's like he's got to be there to clean it up. I always mm. argue with this one. The prelim mates, last year, I got like, caught out about three times. Three times, like all kicks for tries. I just reckon there's times where it's like, where are you? And there was, like there was a point when it was versus Roosters, he was defending on the wing at one point. Mm. Yeah, look, and I get us trail. Like, I'm, yeah, I think it's like one of those things where, like, for sure, he, he could probably be fitter. Like, there's no denying that. I think where maybe in his head he's like, I'm going to win you the game anyway. Like the, kind of the way he thinks probably. Again, I don't know what he's specific thinking, but he's kind of thinking, I'm a bigger, full, I'm a way bigger fullback than normal. So all right, I didn't get back there for the kick, but I can guarantee you I'm about to. Which on the games that he doesn't do that, then you're like, well, mate, you didn't win the game for us. So it, I can understand why it can be like, mate, you've got to at least be there for the kick or whatever. It's a shame he left, though. He was one of the best centers in the game at the Roosters and won two comps, and then he'll probably never win another one. So <laughs> it's a shame. <laughs> Just quickly on Davy Fafida again, I loved what I saw on the weekend. He, he set up a try where he 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 ran that Villiami kick out sweeping line outside the center, I believe it was, and he tipped on. Mm. That said to me that Justin yeah. Holbrook's going, all right, how do we get more out of this bloke? Because we can't rely on him just you know, to get early ball, make him or whatever. It was creative outside the box thinking, even if it was from a Penrith Panthers blueprint. I don't know if that's where Holbrook got it from, but why wouldn't you copy it? Uh, and it just said to me, all right, is there going to be another dimension that ball playing out the back to his game this year? Because why not? Mm. Well, it's the first time we've seen him utilised other than just giving the ball and over. Yeah. Oh, it. mate. Some, some of these, like him being utilised, you're just like, come on, there's got to be more than that. This is professionals. Um, is there any Tigers fans in here? There we go. Oh, mate, you've been quiet, mate. <laughs> how, how are we feeling about the Tigers? Like, I was su- – it's a trial. It's a trial, and we know that trials mean nothing. But I actually felt – like, I was super impressed by the Tigers on the weekend. Well, what's not to be excited about? you got you got Sheens as coach. He's back. Sheen, yes. Hello, sport boys. You like that? <laughs> um, you got Benji in the coaching staff. You got – you signed – you signed Coruscant, Clemmer. Um, you got more senior players that are like off and Gowie, mm. stuff like that. They have contracts until 2025. Mm. What's not to get excited about? Uh, so you, you, you think they're going in the right direction? I think they are, yeah. yeah. Like, like we were talking about the Dragons. Sorry, buddy, again. <laughs> um, we're talking about the culture shift, right? We're talking about the culture shift. And um, last year, we won our first wooden spoon. That was our first wooden spoon since we started in 2000. Yep. Um, and we've already changed that now. Like the culture's changed. Everyone can feel it. It's in the air. Um, I just think it's going to be a good year. Do you, what are your thoughts on the idea that, like, you know, Tim Sheens hasn't coached in the NRL for quite a while? Do you think he's going to have the ability – like, he, he hasn't had success in a substantial amount of time. Do you think that is a concern or not really? Like, he's going to know how to handle it? Well, I think he's already shown what he can do. I mm. mean, security players like Api Corusau and stuff like that, yeah. he knows how to build a team around him. Yeah. And even on the weekend um, against the Raiders – which was a good win. Um, <laughs> Great win. Great win. <laughs> well, they smashed us 54-10 or something last year, so it was good to get a bit of revenge. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, even our forwards, they were running through through grubbers that Dewey was putting through and just scoring off them like they knew where to be. So yeah. um, we didn't see that much last year. Everyone looked sort of scattered and um, just going off Hastings. So. Well, there was, there was one play that I thought really, like, surprised not, – well, not surprised me because it's disrespectful, but, like – we didn't really see this from Tigers. I think it was like 10 minutes to go. Game was in the bag. I think someone took a scoot out of their own end and about four players came in, held him up and dragged him back into goal, like in goal that the Tigers boys did. And it was just a, it was a uh, ruthless play. Like it, they didn't need to do it. They could have just tackled the tackle, defend, end the game. But this kind of new look Tigers and we're going to see more of it. We're not, not too sure whether it will continue. But I think it... It showed a grit that they, a ruthlessness they just haven't had before, or well, yeah. recently. Enter Johnny Bateman too. I enter Johnny Bateman. I think Clem is bringing a lot of aggression with him. He's going to be like the Jared Uri Hargroves for our team. Mm. That's what I see. Um, yeah, I think it's exciting times for the Tigers. Now, I'm, I'm probably a little bit higher on the doggies than the, than the Tigers, but I do think they're heading in the right direction for sure. Uh, Maybe ninth? Ninth? Yeah. <laughs> hey, maybe. maybe. You've got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> Um, which teams haven't we done? We haven't done the Bron- Broncos, I don't think. Have we spoken about the... Anyway, how do, you, do you think the Broncos have a culture issue? Uh, no, we're <laughs> going to win it, so we... <laughs> short segment. So we, uh, no, well, obviously, when a player comes out like Selwyn and says stuff like that, 
and nothing's even really come out about it. Like he played in the trial. I don't know if he's going to get punished or, or like what what's the repercussions for saying that stuff. Like, mm. uh, I, I think they're just in a position where he's such a gun that they've just got to cop it on the chin. And yeah, but if you're a strong club, you can't let that mm. stuff go. Oh, you know what I mean? Know. But did he? Is that it? Fish that ill. That's a lot, to be fair. That's more than I make. So. <laughs> um, uh, no, nah, but like I think there is a little bit of a culture issue. I think mm. we still don't have like – we've got Rano and Kate Wool up there, mm. but I, I just think we need like a few more older fellas just just leading the way. Mm. Like There's just such a bunch of young kids with a lot of talent. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's probably the, the club's biggest concern right now is, is you're right. Like, it's, do we have a senior playing group? Because they're like the most, they're sometimes even more important than a coach. We don't, we don't really have that right now. But, you know, we always harp on and say clubs should look to the future and we've had bad years, so why not look to the future? I got like Paddy Carrigan, even though he's young, I do think that he's stepping up quite well into that leadership role. Yeah, I think, I think Pat and Payne, like, I think, there'll be two blokes that we'll look to beyond Adam and, and Kurt Kate will say. Mm. If Payne I stays, th- geez. Uh, yeah. No, no, he'll be right. <laughs> <laughs> Might um, go to the Dragons, help them a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you seem like a nice guy too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's brutal. Hey, it's not you, it's the Dragons, bro. Like, <laughs> far out. Who, who would have thought? The poor old Dragons getting smashed. Um, did we have we spoken about any uh, not spoken about any other teams that's here anyone Anyone's team we uh, doggies about? doggies how are we feeling about the doggies this year do you think we're still a year away or what uh, we didn't recruit many so it's easy for you to forget um, <laughs> about talking about the team um oh i think we're still a year away um coming from the trials i think the biggest concern well i guess the highlight was trial one um and then seeing them also get flogged by the tigers took a bit of bite out of that um but yeah, week two, I think the biggest concern is still around that seven and one role. Mm. Um, I know Ciro came out earlier this week as well and kind of doubled down on the fact that he wants Hayes at number one. Yeah, it's surpri- I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting to see whether I like fully agree with him being at one. I think he's, he can got a lot of potential, but I, I, he hasn't really wowed in the trials, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I think there's still a lot left to be kind of made a judgment about that. Mm. Um, and especially when Avarillo had kind of, I think, solidified there, I think we'd come in and especially when we know Crichton's coming in. I don't think there's a point of us running another experiment this year when we know we've got Crichton coming next year. I think you're better off just locking in, um, seeing how Flano goes. I think still the biggest issue with Flano is he looks stressed or short of time whenever he's got the ball. Yeah, He's always looking around and double-guessing himself. I think especially in the second trial, I think he got tackled with the ball two, three times just mm. on the fifth tackle, no, nothing to go. So with how, I guess, ad hoc the boys seem to want to play now that we've got kick out, you got the quick play the ball speed from Marnie, like you've got these players here that are looking to, you know, make quick decisions. I'm just not sure if he's going to be the the fit for the mould. I'm not mm. sure if you come through and give Raja a go later in the season, if you get Carl you, crack later. Who do you see, if, if, you're, if you're not fully sold on Flano, I, I, I actually still think that he can be a top eight half, but if you're not fully sold on Flano, who would you go in the market for or would you develop internally? I think we just develop. I, I know I, I, even when uh, it, in the game of the weekend, I think uh, Rajab was only out there for 10, 15 minutes before he got uh, concussed. But he just looked can't, cool as a cucumber. He was out there just playing easy ball. He was running right up to the line before he was playing it out the back. Like he looked really cool out there. Mm. Had a good World Cup and can play one and seven. I know he's still got a bit of size to put on him. Like you said, size not everything when they're a bit young. But if he gets another full season. New South Wales Cup, I don't see any issue with him well, coming through. That's and a tough thing. I don't think he's top 30 at the moment. Yeah, so we'll have to wait later. Yeah. But I, I don't know if we just let Flano have the 11 rounds until we can go through. I think if you've had the full preseason with him, stick with him. Don't chop and change like we did last year. Just give him a crack and um, you just hope the rest of the boys come on, look really good early on, kick out and off early. And yeah. I think it's just hard to tell until we get likes TPJ back as well. Mm. So I think Are there's you, a lot of unknowns. Were you a big fan of Reed before he signed? Or did you not rate him? And did, you know what I mean? Like it's it's easy to say, oh yeah, I'm a big fan now because you got the signing. But before he signed, were you a big fan of Reed? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I, or the biggest trif I had with our own nine of the dogs the last four or five years, um, nothing against JMK's purple patch last year, mm. running games out of this world was doing it again on the trials for the Dolphins. Um, so I think he's come into a great set. But it was just the passing game from our nine's always been a letdown. Like yep. we had, we had a decent play of the ball speed, but the ball would be moving in slow motion in the air. So. 
you'd have guys like Birdo and even Flano just getting the ball a second later than they should be. So mm. Miami's got the best passing game in the comp. If we can get that quick ball, play the ball speed, we've got the forwards to get the go forward now as well. I don't see any issues with us now getting to oppositions in 20 metres. Now we've just got to learn to polish off and get repeat sets or get the tries. So I'm not sure if that's something we can push for. I know uh, Timmy and Guru, you reckon we can kind of sneak in, but yeah, I'm not sure if we can sneak into the eight this year. If we can, happy days. And mm. yeah, obviously next year we'll have a bit more time with the, the combos. What are your thoughts on Burton? Burton, uh, love him. Needs to run more. Um, definitely needs to, I guess, engage that line. That whole left side's going to be phenomenal this year. Crazy, crazy. Um, stoked for that. Yeah. As long as injury free, fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think Burton is. It's hard as well because he's whenever he plays rep footy, he goes into centre and kills it there. Yeah. So, but we can't really afford him to to shift in there when we don't have a viable backup either. So, um, I think that's the toughest thing. Uh, we'd love to see him. Can, you know kick more and rather than he just seems to just kick straight up and down as we'd love to see him get comfortable with more bombs and even the repeat set for grubbers if he takes control inside that 20 if he's comfortable to do that and Flano's not then happy to see him take the reins even mm. if he needs to shift to seven in the future sort of thing hopefully hopefully Flano is the answer at seven for them does the job they make the eight this year and kill it if he is not and he struggles uh, don't to put too much pressure on the young fella but we sat here and spoke about Carl Oluwapu <clears throat> about a month ago when he signed. Mm. All the reports out of Belmore, <clears throat> sorry, is that since he signed there, he's just killing it at training, super professional, mm. lovely young kid, big body about him. You know, there was all this talk of whacking blokes in like the lower grades, whatnot, yep. no matter how big they were, and he's been doing the same at training, just like fitting in perfectly. Yeah. I. I don't think I've been more G'd up for a New South Wales Cup round one game than the doggies just to see Carl mm, play. Yeah. And he's 18, sure, he's young, and it takes time. You don't want to rush these guys. Yeah. But Sammy Walker was the same. Ezra Mann was the same. Mm. And they were a lot smaller bodies than he was. So, look, realistically, maybe he is a year away, possibly more. But on what I'm hearing, I should say, he could be a lot closer than we think, and yeah, it might yeah. be this season. And that's where I think with Canterbury, mm. they've got the gun hooker, got the gun six. Next year, you'll have the gun one. I think Flano can be successful there, but I also think you can work with Carl at halfback there, for sure. Like, I think we always look at premiership winning sides, and I'll throw to you in a minute, but you need the halfback. You can't win without the halfback. It's rare, but it's been done before. Mm. Brisbane, you guys did it. Yeah, Shane Perry, <laughs> the great Shane Perry. Won us a premiership, 2006. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not like... I don't think the spine is a problem for the doggies anymore. Like, I, I do think that they're going to have a, a good enough spine to to push for finals my biggest i guess not concern but it's probably there probably forward pack like where i'm like when i compare that forward pack compared to the big like you know penrith uh roosters that's where i see quite quite a substantial like you've got luke thompson where where's the jury's still out in Pelé, like he's trialed really really well um you know you've got uh kick out on one edge hopefully he can stay injury free on the other edge, still unsure. Will you, will you go Renault? I think they go RFM. Yep. Yeah, RFM on one edge. Um, you know, he has struggled with injury, so he played some decent footy last year, but can he get back to his best footy? Um, and so that's the really interesting thing with dogs is like, I, I probably think that you need Pele to, to kill it, like to come in and be Luke Thompson's right-hand man. But what's weird about like, with the situation with Luke Thompson is really interesting because like, it was only what 10 months ago they were talking about they were looking to release him so it's like do they see him as the path forward i think he's a great front rower yeah. um, and that's where as you said with the canterbury pack you look at it you go geez it's a good pack it's a good pack if they're all firing at the same time which mm. they never are like luke thompson's been in and out rfm's been injured when, like that's nice. max king slowly max king's improving. getting there tavita you you don't know what you're going to get minute to minute, let alone game to game. And like Tavita's on massive coin, Luke Thompson's on massive coin. So I, I think the forward pack is where that they'll probably make some slight adjustments over the next year or two. But I think the the signing of Pele is could be honestly could be game changing for the doggies. That honestly could be the difference between eight finishing in the eight and not in the eight because I think that rotation with Luke Thompson can really work. Because I just felt sometimes <coughs> Luke Thompson was like by himself, just like having a dig. And he just didn't have anyone to kind of go with him. Like it, and I think Pele is a guy that can kind of do that. I'm very excited this season for Jacob Preston. I swear oh, to God, yeah, it's yes. not just because he damned you on Insta. <laughs> I, I think he's a good footballer too. Yep. Uh, it just his stats from last season. He, he's probably more of an edge back rower, but 
scoring tries, assisting tries, massive worker. Again, word out of the club, just kills it at training. Mm. Um, just that coach's dream, won't miss a tackle. He just seems seems like a really well-rounded football for a young fella. Mm. I think the op, uh, injury to TPJ should nearly lock him into a bench spot round one. I think it was probably between Pele and him, mm. depending where they want that size through the middle or another edge for Fatal Mariner, depending what he does. But... Uh, I think we'll get a look at him early on and really, really bright pos- prospects. So even if this season isn't top eight, that's fine. But next season, with a few of these blokes coming through with a bit more experience, far out to bright future. And give Gussie and the Laundy Group back in his. I mean, it's not a bad, not a bad uh, duo to have. Uh, is there any other teams that we haven't done? Anyone? Got to them all that's here? If for, you're taking the <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> My bad. Uh, look, yeah, Raiders. Oh. <laughs> Might make the A, who cares? Seriously, no, I'm it's joking. It's been six months, mate, since we kicked you out of the A. <laughs> You're still filthy. <laughs> um, the Canberra A's. What's, uh, Can I just ask Timmy a question? Yeah, sure. Oh, here I'm we go. He's pretty still sure growing up in Cooma, knowing Timmy for since he was born, yeah. he's been a diehard Bulldog supporter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no was way! was a diehard I Bulldog have... supporter. <laughs> Can we get confirmation here? When did the Raiders change all of a sudden? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for any super coaches out there, I've been open, I, I've been open about this on our podcast. That oh, I, I, August, sure is it, mate? How long do we have left? <laughs> I grew up loving the Bulldogs and still do if you didn't get that by that last 15-minute segment. Uh, so what it was was, grew up loving the Doggies, still do. I was five and a half hours from Belmore Oval. Mm. I was an hour to the gates of Bruce Stadium, it was at the time. Mm. So each weekend we'd go to these Raiders games, go to these Raiders games, grew up loving them. Uh, my, you forced it upon me, I don't like calling it out, but my elder brother was a Canberra Raider. Yeah. So from about 16 years onwards, went to all, thanks Scott, thanks for bringing this up, mate. <laughs> <laughs> You sound defensive, bro. Yeah, like. I am. Def- yeah, I know. Uh, because because I hate our turncoats. But <laughs> so so from 16 years old uh, when he was, I was going to Raiders games week in week out for years and years and years. So uh, from I mean a long time ago now, but I, I've started loving the Canberra Raiders. Uh, been to that with that club for a long time now, and I've uh, grown a big passion for them. So I'm a Raider, have been for a long time, but the doggies from over a decade ago. Uh, we'll always have a soft spot in my heart. Fair enough, Tim. I can't, I can't say anything because my brother here, he's a, he goes from Broncos and Queensland, born in Cooma, New South Wales as well. You know so. what? I wasn't going to bring that yeah. up. <laughs> I'm glad you did. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you think you're an old bloke. You yeah, think you're an old bloke. Yeah, yeah, eh? yeah, I know. No wonder you're so high on the doggies. You're picking two, two horses in one race, <laughs> mate. Um, Raiders. Raiders are actually a really interesting side because coming into this year, I was actually super high on the Raiders. Uh, and I, like, oh, look, it doesn't mean just because they play poorly in the preseason <laughs> games that they're not going to be good. But I was actually like looking at their roster, looking at the fact that Ricky Stewart had like, you know, he turned the ship around. Tarpanet had become one of the best front rows in the game. Papali, he was guiding him. White and Fogarty get to play more together. But like watching the trials, I don't know whether you guys are notoriously just slow starters. If you, if, let's just take the trials out. Let's pretend they didn't happen. I'm actually really high on the Raiders. Like a, a, another mm. year of Fogarty and Whiten together, it's massive. Obviously, the loss of Savage for what two, three rounds? Uh, I think it's about six, isn't it? Broken jaw, eight. So he'll be back in about round six, round five, I'd say. About that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's obviously a big loss. Um, but I actually think that the Raiders have got a good, young, good mixture of old and young, and I, I think that they should be playing finals footy come the end of the year. Uh, I've been a fan since day dot, so I'll take this one, Timmy. <laughs> Real fan. Real fan. Only, he's like five hours away, so he didn't go. So he wasn't even loyal to Bulldogs. Invite your mates to the studio, he said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I'm very, they're very excited. You touched on it there. Fogarty um, getting a full season would be massive. Um, he started to do it last year, but he was playing both, side of the rock, both side of, sides of the ruck. And if he can get that going, and I really love Jackie Boy as second receiver. Mm. So... Um, if Fogarty can sweep round and get that combination going, um, I think that's the real key for our success this year. Um, it's a shame Savage got injured because we haven't had like a healthy spine for so long for like the whole year. But um, if he can get back on the park and we get some combinations going together, um, we we play a style of footy that's sort of I think we can beat anyone on their day. Like uh, that's the hopeful <laughs> that's the hopeful Raider in me. Mm. But um, uh, it's a bit. Um, unorthodox in the way of the second phase footy and the offloads, if we can get that going, um, I think we can beat anyone if we can time our run 
and mm. get some wins, um, be there the right time of the year, then we can beat anyone. I think the Canberra eight is uh, everyone's easy answer for who's going to fall out of the eight. Mm. So they started poorly, and they finished eighth and whatnot. But <coughs> like, I, I think the halves having finally having a preseason together, I think it's going to be massive for Canberra. I think it's going to be huge for them. And I think they're another team that, as much as you look at fullback and you go, Fuck, who's going to play there? Outside of fullback, I love the depth of their squad as well. Mm. I think it's really deep in a number of positions. What do you got? Three or four hookers? Everywhere except fullback. Everywhere except depth. fullback, which of course is the one spot you're going to injure. And I think the answer was touched on there. We are so short of a fullback. Like it could be said, Chris lining up at fullback for us round one. Uh, the way hopefully around that is, all right, you have to get Jack swinging both sides of the ruck because we're just lacking that ball player because we don't have a ball playing fullback. Mm. Even when Savage is there, to be honest, it might do wonders for us if we're looking long term because if we do get this structure where, you know, Jamal's the controlling seven, we have Jack. I've always wanted, like yourself, Jack swinging both sides of the ruck. He's a second receiver, he's a ball runner, mm. and you don't want him to have to control the team. So. By him doing that, it sort of alleviates a bit of that issue around the ball playing fullback. When Xavier does come back, if, if they can make this click, uh, there's opportunity in a what's a dark time in, in regards to the fullback. Do, do you think nine is a bit of a, uh, a question mark? In, like Danny Levi looks like the guy that's going to get the starting role. Been to quite a few clubs, probably hasn't locked down a starting role. Then you've obviously got Starling coming off the bench. Starling, good, solid bench player, brings impact. But do you think that... Like nine could be the area where you may not have, you, you may have questions throughout the year. Like, because if Danny goes down, then obviously you've got uh, Wolford, is it, mm. to come in? But, you know, is he first grade material? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. Do you think nine's somewhere where you could be a concern? Nine is definitely an issue. And ideally, you want a creative hooker in the modern game. The thing is, you don't necessarily need it. Of course, we all want Appy Corrissey or Damien Cook running out of dummy half, controlling, having perfect ser perfect service, but it's not always as simple as that. What that means is you just put a hooker in there who can give good service. Mm. Look at what Lockie Croker's done at Manly. Yeah. All right, he's not a world beater, wouldn't be on a lot of cash. That means you can splash elsewhere. Uh, and I just don't think there is the quality hooking depth in the NRL at the moment where every club can have that. So yes, it's an issue, but whether it be Wolford or Levi, if they can sit there, defend well, give good early service, uh, bring the forwards onto the ball, and then we do have that X-Factor 9 of Tommy Starling off the bench. Mm. The thing about it is, if we can hang in that first 20 or 30, get in the grind with our big pack, which is our, that's where we win games, mm. Once they get that roll on through the middle, that's where Tommy Starling comes on after 30 and just goes whack, whack, whack. Mm. So there are ways around it, but yes, it's an issue. What do you reckon is an issue? Or yeah, not? totally agree. The, yeah. the key is to um, get the most out of Tommy Starling. He's the, he's the answer at nine. And um, however, you can get him making less tackles and less um, effort plays rather than just running the ball and getting, uh, getting on the back of a quick um, play the balls. Um, and if that's Woolford or Levi, I think they could play a similar role, yeah. Uh, we'll just talk about Cowboys quickly because I don't think we've spoken about Cowboys, have we? Not not in depth. Um, I actually think Scotty Drinkwater is a smoky for Dally M. I think he's a smoky. I was going to say the same thing earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, took it from you. Yeah. Oh, I know more rugby <laughs> than you. No, no, I think he's a smoky for Dally M. He looks confident. Another, He didn't even play a whole year at fullback last year. Uh, you look at their spine, you've got Tommy Dearden who went into Origin and killed it. Chad, the great Chadwick Townsend. Like... <laughs> I, I then you've got well you've got to fly back up to training tomorrow but you've got Reese Robson <laughs> um, I really like what I'm seeing at the Cowboys like when you look at that spine that spine could win a premiership you already know they can because Chad Townsend has Scotty Drinkwater was I think fourth on the Daly M last year yep. um, Tommy Dearden has played well in origin so we know he can play in the big games Reese Robson may get called he may be the starting hooker for New South Wales this year like we that's how good he is at the moment. You look at the forward pack, incredible. Outside backs, you've got the Dally M centre. You've got Tuolungi, who is uh, Tuolungi that played for Australia. Like, the Cowboys are looking red hot, in my opinion. What, what are your thoughts with the Cowboys? Yeah, very exciting, I think. Um, you look at how they went last year, and there's a few blokes that had, like, career high years. And that, I guess that's what kind of worries me, because they've got to go back to that level mm. to achieve that. Um, but what I saw on the weekend, like, even their first try, Tommy Dearden skipping across field and he hits Val who just accelerated like yeah. a freight train. It was horny to watch. Yeah. You know, and then... I get the same feeling <laughs> watching footy all the time. Yeah. <laughs> there was a bit of movement. And then <laughs> you look at... <laughs> you look at Drinky. Um, I, 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 the, the whole team really, I love the coaching of Peyton. 
Like you know that every week, whoever he picks, 17 blokes are going to be fit, mm. they're going to be strong and they're going to have a go and not give up. That's mm. what I see. Yeah. Um, and very encouraging of like open space footy, new age footy. Like on the weekend, there was a kick to Felt on the right wing. He catches it, rockets it 20 metre right to left to Drinky, who mm. almost lets it go another one to Tulagi. Um, there was Drinky throwing the ball in the in goals. There's the two short dropouts. Um, Nanai showing that he can back it up. Mm. Yeah, it was, it was really exciting, I think. If there's one concern, what is what, like I agree with you, the one concern I would have for the Cowboys is sometimes, like I think, you know, Michael Maguire struggle with this sometimes where the years where he's won the Premiership, he had these crazy preseason and this crazy training resume that like, you know, got the boys in a crazy nick, but you can't do that every single year. And so the only thing, and I'm not saying Top Hayden's the same as that, but we do know they notoriously had a really tough preseason last year. And that's my only concern is, is like, are they working too hard? Like, is there, is there going to be burnout? Um, I don't think there will be, but that has to be a question you have to ask. Cause like a bunch of players that were playing down here literally went up to like in a whole, in a season, can they do it again kind of thing? I saw it was on the Matty John's face to face where he had Todd Payton. Mm. Um, and I think there's a big difference We've all, we've all been, you know, played footy and been flogged. There's a difference between being flogged um, and, and what I'm about to say. But the biggest thing that I took away from it was he was talking about his preseason mm. and he said his biggest thing last year was making the boys do things they are uncomfortable doing. Mm. And it was more so around like, oh, yeah, guys, come in tomorrow, we're doing a pool sesh. And then he'd flog them mm. because they weren't ready for that or mid-flogging and would break off and do ball work or something. He's, I really liked that modern-day coach's philosophy of making them do uncomfortable things and for me that's what provides grit and um decision making under fatigue mm. and uh, and creativity as well yeah um which i think shone through in their footy last year and even so far this year and not and allowing like something bad happens in a game and like your reaction is negative usually like oh something bad like we drop the ball oh. yeah. whereas like if you get used to things just happening bad and going it's not going to affect our attitude. That can really help you. Yeah, like it's not just like, uh, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Like, mm. what do we do now? You know, just last year I saw a, a resilience in them and um, just always just on to the next one, on to the next one. Mm. Make six tackles, we'll get the ball back. Yep. Um, in answer to your other question of what one problem was, um, I worry about the 14. Mm. Uh, Jake Granville was the 14 on the weekend and huge respect for Granville last year. He played fullback at one stage and centre another and was arguably the best player in the field in both yeah. those games. So I don't like saying it, but I think Jake's best football is behind him. Mm. I hope a 14 can spring out this year, whether it's young Tom Chester or a journeyman in Ben Hampton. Um, I just hope someone can own that jersey. Ben Hampton had a pretty good trial, I reckon, especially the first one. He was all right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't know, I don't know if he's the answer. Mm. Um, I, I don't have an answer. Yeah but I just hope someone springs out because mm. yeah, I worry about, you guys talked about longevity of players like um, playing 80 each week at hooker. Mm. I, I don't think Robbo can do that all year. Yeah, especially with the way he plays, super yeah, aggressive. Too tough for his own good. Yeah. yeah. I think Chester is your answer, but I couldn't yeah, I think believe so. he didn't play last week. No, he, he didn't play last week. That shocked nah. me. Which, I don't know, is that a good sign or a bad sign? Um, like yeah, are they trying to not rush him? Maybe, yeah. yeah or, fair. or is there? Are they seeing? You know, there's certain attitude things he needs to fix. Um, yeah, fair. I, when I saw him not named, I was a bit thinking perhaps that can go two ways. He's not ready. We're done with him. He's going to start the year in cup. Mm. Or we've seen enough. He's going to be the 14 in round one. So why does he need to play? Mm. I'm not sure. We'll know. Yeah, next I Tuesday. think my experience, like playing footy, if you're not in that last trial, you're not you're not going to get selected unless someone plays super poorly and you play really good in the New South Wales Cup trial or Queensland Cup trial, I think it may be a, a, like probably a, a not rushing him uh, decision because you've got such a strong, strong squad. There's no reason to bring in. Because how old is he? 21, 22. So yeah. quite young. You've got such a good <coughs> squad. You don't need to – like I think Melbourne Storm do it really well. Like they've had Jack Haworth sitting in – he's on a massive contract and he's played reserve grade all last year because they understand that – you only get your first year once and if he has a like look how long tom dearden took to recover from the situation at the broncos and how poorly that was all handled like he was like tom Peyton said in that interview with maddie johns um <laughs> he was a shell of a person a shell like it took him that long to turn it around like there were people that like tom dearden was getting mocked like as in like it was almost the butt of a joke 
And now he is an Origin player impacting Origin games, which shows you how <coughs> crucial that first year or two is in a career. So it may be patience, I think. Uh, in that interview too, it just struck me of how much of a locker room guy Todd Payton is. Yeah. Well, like Matty asked him about Tom Dearden's debut for Origin and he's sitting at home on the lounge. He's talking about like a proud dad. Yeah. And he yeah. just, just gave me goosebumps. Of like there's just blokes that just want to play for this bloke. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and then you still got Hylam Luki to come back. We've got oh, huge man. raps on. Yeah. He'll play Origin, I reckon, oh, next year or two. He'll play talent, Origin. like where's his ceiling? Mm. I, I don't know. What's um, funny is like Nanai, probably pri prior to last year, you would have had Luki in front of Nanai, and yet so that shows you how good Luki is. If Nanai's gone fucking yeah through he, the roof, he's got every trick in the bag that like a he, he needs to have to succeed, yep. and then Luch to come back to. Yeah. Um, pending, Hopefully. you know, whenever that may be. Yeah. Even if he pops back in round 12 after, you know, um, his things are settled, um, like hypothetically, mm. it's not like he's coming back from a knee or something like that. Yeah. If he pops back in round 12 and he's straight into the bench, you know he's getting flogged and he's fit every yeah, week. for sure. Luke, he's quite like Sean Lane to me. And he's that big, rangy, tall, awkward back rower who runs a great line. But he's more explosive than Sean Lane. Like he is so powerful, yeah. so strong. He gets through a lot of work. Too. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, yeah. He's super exciting. Um, I think that's it, boys and girls. I think that's it. Uh, all teams done. That's that's here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you so much for coming, guys. That was great. Really enjoyed it. I could honestly talk for hours longer. Uh, powered by Bloke Beer, as always. Get down to your local, grab a case of Bloke Beer, and every celebrations bottle of Porter's liquor, IJ Plus liquor, New South Wales ACT. <laughs> um, and as usual, I'll go and fuck myself. Thank you. <laughs>